We're running a couple, a couple of minutes behind. Uh, we were in executive session, so we had a little transition. Welcome to City Council Chambers. Good to see you. This is the Portland City Council meeting in a regular meeting. I think tonight's regular. It's April 24th, um, and I will call this meeting to order and invite you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. And we do have Councillor Trevorrow with us um, on Zoom. So I'll ask the uh, clerk to please call the roll. Councillor Fournier? Here. Councillor Rodriguez? Here. Councillor Dion? Here. Councillor Ali is here, but he must have stepped out. Councillor Zaro? Here. Councillor Trevorrow? Here. Councillor Pelletier? Here. Councillor Phillips? Here. Mayor Snyder? Here. Uh, it's five o'clock. Well, it's a couple minutes after five o'clock. If there's anybody here or on Zoom who would like to address the council on items that are not on tonight's agenda, now is the opportunity to do that. So go ahead and raise your hand or step forward to the mic. Um, if that's your intention, we'll start here in chambers. Um, please give us your name and either the organization that you represent or the neighborhood that you live in. We'll start right here in chambers with you, Stephen. Stephen Sharp of Brackett Street in Portland. Uh, I have two items I'm gonna to speak to you about. First is the, um, I went on to get the agenda uh, over the weekend and it's like a new website has popped up on me and I'm like very confused by it. Um, I I finally figured out just now how you get to the agenda package, the old style agenda package uh, packet so that you can actually see the paragraphs but what you're presenting to the public uh, as an easy access is not uh, what uh, we should be presenting. We should be presenting that agenda packet so people realize that it's there and they can easily access it. Uh, what, what you've basically done is it, it looks like more, you know, 2023, but it's not. We need it's a clean and simple agenda package for people to read and understand what's on your agenda. I've always appreciated the fact that you put paragraphs of information about what the agenda item is about. And that should be easily accessible to the public. The other thing I wanted to speak to you about is uh, I'm really uh, concerned about an article I uh, saw in the uh, paper today about a um, new business being opened on Exchange Street. Spent a lot of money importing doors from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Installed them and found out that they're not historically accurate. Can you please tell me where in the uh, old port anything is, quote, historically accurate? I'm sure he can walk around and eventually find some other non-historically accurate doors and use them as examples. Our historic preservation department is out of control and needs to be reined in. We need to accommodate that, uh, uh, that business and immediately tell him that he should uh, keep his doors. And uh, the doors are beautiful, by the way, absolutely beautiful. I have no idea why anybody would object to them. So that's what my request to you is to immediately reach out to that uh, uh, business owner and tell him his doors are perfectly fine and that uh, we, we quote, made a mistake. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Stephen. Um, Peter, I'm gonna connect with you up there. We have the, the clock facing the gallery. Should we flip that around so that you can get it on the camera? Okay. That, oh, thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate your help. Perfect. I want... Because uh, I know that people look for that when they're uh, on Zoom, and that gives them the opportunity to see their time. For anybody in chambers, we'll just give you the 30-second warning as usual. Um, okay, thanks for that pause. We'll head over to Zoom. We've got a hand up from David Ritter. David, you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay, we're gonna move on. If any, is there anybody in chambers? Yeah, so go ahead and line up right behind the podium if you're here to speak so that we don't have to uh, pause, but we, and we know that you're here, we'd be happy to hear from you. Go ahead. Sorry about that. No, that's fine. Hi everyone, my name is Taylor Cray. I work for Preble Street's advocacy team and I know you have an emergency meeting tomorrow night to discuss housing, but I wanted to come forward and read a statement from Preble Street um, about the current encampment on the Bayside Trail and the proposed clearing of that encampment. Oh. Sorry, can you hear me if I can? Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, 
The encampment on the Bayside Trail is a visual representation of the fact that we are in the midst of a homelessness crisis, a crisis that is occurring all across Maine, not just here in Portland. It is absolutely devastating that so many people are left living outside and unsheltered due to a massive shortage of shelter beds, a lack of affordable housing, and insufficient resources for people with mental health and substance use disorders. Every day, we see individuals suffering the severe health consequences of living unsheltered. And our partners at the National Health Care for the Homeless Council just released a study showing that continuous displacement by encampment sweeps leads to even higher rates of mortality, overdoses, and hospitalizations. It doesn't have to be this way. We need to advocate for more for emergency shelter funding, site-based housing first programs, and treatment programs for people with substance use and other mental health disorders. So that is the Preble Street statement on the encampment sweep, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your comment. And we'll head back over to Zoom. Uh, Mr. Saget. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, this is Richard Ward, Parkside Neighborhood, District 2. Leftist media keeps pushing the LGBT narrative to confuse children and sicken our society. The Western world is the only place where this filth is tolerated. We need to take a stand against the pedophilic degenerate cult. An Islamic nation would never tolerate this, and us Americans shouldn't either. Let us not forget just recently in Tennessee, a mentally ill transgender person gunned down three children and three adults. We don't need gun control. We need to crack down on the violence from the left. Democrats countrywide celebrated the killing of innocent Christians. Where was the comment from the city on the Covenant school shooting? But they had a comment when it was about George Floyd, aka fentanyl Floyd. It's disgusting to see leftist cheer for drag queen shows with kids to convince children they are the wrong gender and to drag and to encourage surgical genital mutilation. Leave the children alone. What is a woman? The Cambridge Dictionary says a woman is an adult female human being. Does taking hormone blockers make you a woman? Does castrating yourself make you a woman? Does dressing up make you a woman? Does believing you're a woman make you a woman? No, doing all these things just makes you a mentally ill man. It's wrong for society to cater to a seriously ill minority of people and expect us to go along with their delusional thinking. When someone suffers from schizophrenia, Michael, we don't reinforce the delusions as truth, and we shouldn't for transgenderism either. Seriously, when they don't even know what gender they are. Transgender women are men. Transgender men are women. When they are in their graves 200 years later, if scientists dig up their bones, they'll know that the transgenders were men. Pills, surgery, and imagination won't fool scientists. Your DNA won't change just because you have an unhealthy fascination. Pushing this stuff onto children is child abuse, and we shouldn't condone it. Why do children need to learn about gender pronouns when they can't even tie their shoes? Why are teachers telling students not to tell their parents about the topics of discussions in school? not push the transgender narrative we wouldn't have so many confused people the lgbtq plus cult is a cult which is a relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister the mentally ill minority must not be allowed to rule over the rest of us where do we draw the line child castration having children taken from parents for not going along with the mob having sex offenders teach children at this point nothing is off the table for the degenerate woke leftist cult for being a group that wants acceptance, they are quick to advocate for violence against anyone who disagrees with them. We will never cower in fear to the terrorists. We will not surrender our country to left-wing scum. Only two genders- 30 second the warning. amount of tantrums will change that. Sometimes the truth hurts and some of you need to hear it. How can regular people just, who just want to be left alone coexist with a group that literally want to rape and kill children? If liberals can't abort babies, they'll try to rape them. Thank you. Any other public comment from Chambers? Hi, my name is Sarah Lentz. I uh, live at 27 Arlington Street. Um, and I just wanted to say that I unequivocally stand with our LGBTQ plus community um, and all of the other marginalized groups uh, in Portland. And I'd just like to take up equal space right now from what we just heard. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. We'll head back over to Zoom and we will hear from Bill Higgins. It's like, hello, it's Bill Higgins from Homeless Advocacy for All and a Portland resident. I wanna speak out against the proposed clearing of the supportive tent community along the Bayside Trail. Uh, I'll call that a tent community rather than an encampment. And Sweep. We should be sweeping trash, not people. Uh, I agree with uh, the Pearl Street statement. 
We have no shelter space available in this city. Uh, that was a result of the ESAC member meeting uh, as last Thursday. We should create a site where the camping could be could be uh, set up here in Portland and also provide uh, bathroom facilities, a way to wash uh, for people to take a shower and to wash clothing. That would help them not lose uh, their dignity. And also they, they could keep their documents to help them find housing. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your comment, Bill. Anybody else in chambers who would like to step forward? Okay, we'll head back to Zoom. TJ Malone, please. Yes, this is TJ Malone from the Liberal Revolution. Uh, and I'm representing the LGBTQ community. And uh, we just heard a slew of uh, transphobic and homophobic hatred from Richard Ward, as we in the LGBTQ community know him as Dick Ward. Sorry, when comments are directed at a person, we're not allowed to take them, um, right? Or swearing. Or swearing. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I ask once again, if there's anybody here in chambers who would like to speak, I see none. We'll head over to our next speaker, whose hand just went down. Okay, thank you everybody. I'm gonna close public comment and we will, uh, come back to our agenda. Are there any announcements from the council this evening? Councilor Ali. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, I have been asked by the community. So um, the past few days, uh, Muslims from all over the city and the state and the country and probably the world uh, fasted for 30 days and uh, we had Eid. Uh, so congratulations to all those that have done that. However, uh, the community leaders uh, on Eid um, at Fitzpatrick asked me to publicly thank city staff, Kevin McPhee, uh, that every year, even though uh, they rent the space, he goes above uh, and beyond to make sure that people are accommodated. He's very helpful and that they appreciate um, his um, the work that he puts in every year when um, the community comes and rent a space from the city. So Kevin, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Ali. Are there announcements from any other councillors? Councillor Phillips? Um, it's not really a, an announcement, it's a comment that I, you know, uh, after listening to uh, public comment, um, I know that we have some procedural things, or rules and regulations around what people can say when they call in. Um, and I think what we need to do from this point on is just remind people um, exactly what they can and what they cannot say when they come and make public comment. Um, everybody is allowed free speech. I'm not saying that we should squash free speech, but there is some decorum that we have to have in having to sit here and listening to public comment. So from now on, I say that whenever, before we're gonna do public comment, that we remind the, remind the public what they can and what they cannot say. And uh, that will allow us to be able to um, be able to uh, listen better. Yeah, I appreciate that, Councillor um, Phillips. It's it's awfully hard to navigate up here when we're managing uh, free speech. Our council rules are, are, are vague. Um, we can certainly change those to be more specific if we'd like to govern behavior here in chambers the way we do in, with some of our other rules. But I'm gonna turn to Corporation Council at this moment, if you wouldn't mind just to talk a little bit about that struggle that we have when it comes to free speech and public comment in the chamber? Um, I, I think with the open comment uh, period that we have, um, we have, uh, it, it needs to be viewpoint neutral. Um, and if we are going to accept, uh, accept public comment on any non-agended um, item, it needs to be we need to allow all viewpoints to be able to present themselves. There are, um, we are allowed to put bumpers on that in the rules and maybe some clarity on those rules would be um, one way to address it as you suggest, Mayor. Is public comment on non-agended items required? No. Thank you. 
Councillor Ali. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, Corporation Council, you said that uh, we can set bumpers uh, through the rules. That's correct. I mean, I, I think we have to keep in mind that it's not this open public comment period is something that that the council has included in its rules um, and allows um, to the extent that the that the council wants to tighten that up. Um, it can do so. It doesn't uh, need to allow the public comment at all. There are times when um, th there are particular um, uh, statutory requirements. There are particular uh, statutory requirements where public comment has to be allowed. The public has to be given an opportunity to be heard. Um, if we are going to have an open public comment um, period, we are able to put some guardrails on that. Um, but it does have to be uh, does have to be viewpoint neutral. Yep, I wouldn't want to take away the. Uh, public comments on non altogether not on non-agenda item i don't want to take it away oh you don't want i want it to be because it's a uh, increases uh engagement and participation uh however uh if we want to move forward and put some real guard as you mentioned on the non-agenda uh public comment uh do we have to bring back because the rules committee have been do we have to create a new rules committee or uh the yeah, I mean, the rules committee is the committee that meets to draft the proposed revisions. Um, right. And so that would be, I think that would be the first sort of procedural step would be having the council um, assign it to the rules committee to to review and, and draft some okay. revisions. Thank you, Maxim, because then, we don't have a rules committee anymore. We, in the past few years, we've we've developed a rule committee as needed. Yeah. So annually, because obviously we have to revise our rules and approve them every year at inauguration. And then we've also had a rules committee ad hoc whenever we need it. So we can certainly form a rules committee to take this on. Okay, no, thank you. I would suggest we should go into that direction. Making a note of that. Thank you, Councillor. Any other announcements this evening, Councillor Pelletier? Thank you. Um, I know we've talked about process a little bit with the public comment conversation that was really helpful uh, to hear just in terms of what we're able to do. Um, and I know that, that that was really hard to listen to for a lot of individuals on the call. So this is just me again. I feel like we talk about this every meeting now. I've probably said this every meeting, but just like always standing in unequivocal uh, support with my LGBTQ plus community of Portland and to the black and brown community of Portland. I see you, um, I always stand with you and you are very much welcome here. Thank you, Councillor. Other announcements from the council, Councillor Fournier. Thank you, and we might not have it for this meeting and I think that's okay, but one of the things I was struck by in that comment that was made is the number of um, false falsities that were included in that, which I'm not sure that false information is protected under the First Amendment. Um, and so I, not necessarily for this moment, but maybe as we're continuing to discuss where those guardrails are is how can we interrupt comment when that happens? Um, I think it was unfortunate that the individual who was speaking, yes, he did name you know, the community member who had spoken before that in, I think, a tongue in cheek way. However, um, I, I do think in the past we've corrected people to say, please address your comments to the chair rather than ending the call because I think the rest of their, and I, I could be assuming, but I think the rest of what they would have shared would have been more in support of the community. Um, so just, I think something to keep in mind there. And as the parent of a trans child, that sucked to listen to. Um, and I very much know that my child is very aware of my service on the council, listens to council meetings, and for all of the youth in our community who are part of the LGBTQ plus um, community who have to hear that and know that that exists in our city, um, that's incredibly harmful. And we know that the rates of 
um, suicide and self-harm and mental health um, with that population um, are incredibly high. And so I think it is our responsibility as elected leaders who hold these different identities to also reassure them that, you know, we are here for you. We are here to support you. We will not continue our giving up the fight to find a way to limit um, the hatred that's coming towards us. And I, I do think that there are different ways that we can explore this. I, you know, absolutely First Amendment protections are there, but I think there's a there's a fine line between First Amendment protections and emotional abuse of our community members and harm um, and hate towards our community members. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Do I see any other hands up at this time? Well, I certainly took note of the creation of a rules committee, which we can get right on. And, um, and you know, I, I, I do my best to adhere strictly to our rules and to look to Corporation Council when things get tricky, as they have many, many times. Um, sometimes, um, you know, differing, it, it, well, let's just say it's been challenging across the board um, to try to manage my mute button or um, navigate comment in this chambers. So greater specificity within our rules and also greater um, uh, familiarity with our council rules would be helpful um, for, for everybody. And it's always awful to be part of a situation that um, is not only hard to navigate, but I know is hurtful and hateful. So um, not, not thrilled with that in this public chambers. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, to the approval of our minutes from our previous meeting. I have a motion to approve the minutes from the April 10th council meeting. So moved. All right. Councilor Ali with a second from Councilor Zaro. Um, is there any council comment on the draft minutes? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote to approve those. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Didn't hear it. Did, does Councilor Toro? Yeah, okay, great. Yes. Okay, so, so those passed unanimously. Um, and we'll move on to um We don't have any proclamations on the agenda this evening. I thought we did. No proclamations. Okay, we'll head into appointments. Will the clerk please read Order 175? Order 175, 22, 23, appointing warden and ward clerks for the 2023 2024 election year, sponsored by Ashley Brand, city clerk. Great. And I'll look to the interim city manager for comment on Order 175. I think Ashley could comment, but I'll comment for her. Um, I think this is just a regular order we do every year, um, appointing all the various ward and ward. Uh, wardens and ward clerks. Um, and uh, so it's just normal course of business. Thank you. Public comment on order 175. Seeing none in chambers or on Zoom, I'll close public comment and come back to the council for a motion, please. So moved. Second. Councillor Rodriguez with a second from Councillor Ali. Is there any council discussion on order 175? Seeing none, we'll go, go ahead and vote to approve that order. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yay. Councilor Zaro? Councilor Chavarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. That passes unanimously. Will the clerk please read Order 176? Order 176, 22, 23, appointing members to various boards and commissions sponsored by the Legislative and Nominating Committee, Mayor Kate Snyder, Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm actually going to jump right in here. I think it's okay for me to do that. We, we have had some requests for information with regard to this action on our agenda. The nominated, legislative and nominating committee has been made aware of those requests for information, and we need an opportunity to um, talk about response from Corporation Council's office with regard to the request for information. So I'm going to offer a motion to postpone this. Um, at this time, and I look for a second. Second. Councilor Dion with a second. Is there any council discussion on the ocean? Oh, sorry, motion to postpone to May 1st. Council second. discussion on the motion to postpone. We'll take it up next week. We'll go ahead and vote on that motion to postpone. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trabarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, 
we just didn't have time to um, react to that. Uh, well, the, so we, the next uh, two items on our agenda are consent items, both orders 177 and 178. Will the clerk please read those into the record? Order 177, 22, 23, setting the time for opening and closing the polls on June 13th, 2023, regarding municipal election, sponsored by Ashley Rand, City Clerk, and Order 178, 22, 23, declaring June 10th, 2023, the Shipyard Old Port Half Marathon and 5K Festival, sponsored by Daniel West, Interim City Manager. Thank you. So consistent with our consent calendar, we take public comment on any items that are on the consent uh, calendar at the same time, and we act at the same time unless there's a, re a, needs, a reason that we need to break them apart. So any public comment, please, on orders 177 and 178. Yeah. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment, come back to the council for a motion on both orders. So moved. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with a second from Councilor Dion. Are there any questions or comments from the council? about these items before you this evening. Seeing none, we can go ahead and vote to approve both. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Both pass unanimously, thank you. Next, we head into the licenses portion of our agenda. We've got several before us this evening. We'll start with the clerk reading order 179. Order 179, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of LB Kitchen. Application is for an outdoor dining on uh, public property located at 255 Congress Street, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you. Is there any public comment on order 179? Uh, we have a hand up on Zoom from Nyalot. Bill, you? Am I, am I, okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, if y'all approve this, it'll be pretty insane to approve a private business use of public land, but not the unhoused folks that need actual housing and need actual public um, space to be able to, to live and get their needs met. So I just think it's funny that these private businesses are allowed to be able to utilize public space, but real people aren't. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any additional public comments on order 179? Okay, seeing none, I'll close public comment and come back to the council. I'll offer a motion. I look for a second. Second. Councilor Diane with the second. Any comments or discussion from the council? This license that's before you tonight. We'll go ahead and vote on it. Councilor Forner? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 179 passes unanimously, and I want to acknowledge if the owners of LB Kitchen are here with us this evening in person or on Zoom, looking around. Um, if you are, thank you very much for um, being here and for doing business in the city of Portland. Will the clerk please read Order 180? Order 180, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of Hard Shark Distilling Company. Application is for a Class A lounge with outdoor dining located on private property located at 53 Washington Ave, sponsored by Daniel West, Interim City Manager. Thank you. Is there public comment on Order 180? I see none. I'll close public comment and I will offer a motion. Look for a second. So moved. Looking for a second. Second. Thank you, Councillor Diane. Is there any council discussion? I see none. We can go ahead and vote on order 180. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 180 passes unanimously. And thank you to the owners of Hardshore Distilling Company for doing business in the city of Portland. Will the clerk please read order 181. Order 181, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of Flatbread Company. Application is for an indoor entertainment license located at 72 Commercial Street, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you. Is there any public comment on order 181? See none, I'll close public comment, come back to the council for a motion. So moved. Second. Councillor Rodriguez with a second from Councillor Zaro. Any discussion on 181? 
Go ahead. We'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chavarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Uh, that passes unanimously, and I'd like to take a minute to recognize Flatbread and thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. Will the clerk please read Order 182? Order 182, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of nightmares. Lo application is for a Class A lounge located at 59 Washington Ave, sponsored by Daniel West, Interim City Manager. Thank you. Is there any public comment on Order 182? Seeing none, I'll close public comment and I'll come back to the council for a motion, please. So moved. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with a second from Councilor Zaro. Council discussion. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote to approve. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chavarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 182 passes unanimously. And uh, thank you to Nightmares for doing business in the city of Portland. Will the clerk please read Order 183? Order 183, 2223, granting municipal officers approval of room for improvement. Application is for outdoor dining on pu uh, public property located at 41 Wharf Street, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Uh, thank you. Is there public comment on Order 183? I have a hand up from uh, William Higgins. I have a question. Will that impinge on public access to for walking uh, on sidewalks and stuff? I'm sorry, Bill. Could, do you mind repeating the yeah. question? Will, will that impinge on access to for the public to walk on sidewalk and such? Uh, there's one thing we need to stay be aware of. Thank you for the question. I'm happy to bring it up during council discussion. Any other comment on Order 183? Yes, Stephen Shaw for Brackett Street. I'm going to comment essentially on the same thing. Um, I'm just looking at the diagram for this uh, property, and they uh, wish to actually cover the entire length of sidewalk or width of sidewalk, and and then make Wharf Street the only walking place. Yes, Wharf Street is strictly a walking street, except for deliveries. Actually, we should further limit deliveries on Wharf Street, but that's a different issue. Um, I so I actually have uh, significant concern with. Um, this uh, um, outdoor dining application. I think you should look at it carefully and, and uh, analyze. I actually think you should table this and, or the outdoor part and, have, and, and look at the situation uh, more closely. Um, I also didn't look at the other one that was commented on, um, <clears throat> but they are putting their um, dining on the outside of the sidewalk because of a tree well. I don't think there's actually enough room in there uh, for that other one, but uh, you already approved that one at this point. So um, unless we're going to go back and uh, rescind that approval and look at it more carefully, um, you, we, I, I think we need to be very carefully looking at the various locations and saying, <clears throat> is there really enough room for people to pass? Just because it says four feet doesn't mean that's really enough room for people to pass and be comfortable passing by people who are eating on this side and sidewalk here or sidewalk, et cetera. So just wanna um, express those concerns for future um, uh, dining, outdoor dining permits. So, And the other issue I have with outdoor dining permits is that they tend to be staked somewhere, but those barriers like creep out further on the street as time goes by. And we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, there are certain places on Congress Street that like to allow their barriers to creep out further into the sidewalk. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your comment. I'm having a little Zoom glitch here. Um, because none of my attendees are showing up. I have, I, I, oh, sorry. I do see that, but I am only, I don't see the name of the person. So Jessica, if you could let. Yeah, um, Mayor, the name is Brenton Dupree. Okay, Dupree, great. I think. For some reason, my attendee list isn't populating on Zoom. So I'm going to um, move my Wi-Fi, which oftentimes just doesn't connect in here. Okay, thank you. Hi, Brenton Dupay, uh, East Bayside. I think the outdoor dining is a cool idea. Um, a lot of cities have made it work. 
we can make it work too. I thought one of the best parts of COVID was the outdoor dining through the city. Um, yeah, I, I really support the outdoor dining. I think it's a good idea. I hope it happens more and I support it. Thanks. Okay, thank you for your comment. Other comments in order 183. Okay, I don't think I have any, Jessica, can, can you double check? I don't think I have any hands up on Zoom. All set, there are no more. <laughs> no funny. Okay, I'm, I'm, my attendee side is not showing up at all. So I'm gonna rely on you for that unless the Wi-Fi improves. Um, we'll close public comment on order 183 and I'll come back to the council for a motion, please. Move passage. And I will second that. So motion by Councilor Zaro, second from me, council discussion on 183. Um, I do want to, I think we have, um, uh, let's see, do we have Zachary with us? Um, I just wanted to, uh, oh, great. Zachary Leonard, um, would you mind addressing the comments that were offered during public comment as we contemplate this license approval this evening? Um, yeah, any applicant that does submit um, after approval, um, our health inspectors go out and mark the space. And at that time, they'll um, make sure the design standards are being met of the um, not exceeding 60% of the sidewalk width, maintaining the four feet, um, any of those trees and obstructions, um, also maintaining uh, five feet around corners and um, the space around those obstructions. So very often what happens after approval is um, the space gets modified um, a little bit smaller than what's approved, drafted, once we get out there and start marking it out, measuring it. Uh, thank you for that. Maybe some questions coming your way. Um, are there any uh, questions from the council specific to that? Councilor Fournier? Thank you, Mayor. Um, the question I have, and I think it's a really good point that they brought up, um, I've walked down Wharf Street myself, and I never walk down the middle cobblestones. I have weak ankles. <laughs> so uh, even in the best tennis shoes, um, I am likely to fall um, or twist my ankle uh, going down that middle. So I am always walking on um, the brick sidewalks. And the way that this plan reads is on the side that room for improvement is, it's an eight foot clearance from the building to where the cobblestone begins. And that will be completely blocked by this bar. Um, and so certainly someone could go on the brick sidewalk on the other side, but I do worry um, with our um, community members or visitors that are in wheelchairs, that are in motorized scooters, that are using any sort of um, uh, assisted walking devices, um, they would be forced to walk on the other side, but still going across that cobblestone. So I um, am not excited about that completely um, closing off that side of the street. I don't know if there's any way to reduce that from eight feet um, so that there is still the opportunity for individuals to walk on that side. Um, I, I too enjoy dining outdoors and like the uh, ability to do that, especially in the summertime here, but um, I do hear and share those concerns for our, our community members who feel that completely closing off that side um, is not in the best interest. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comment. Any other comments or discussion from the council on order 183? Seeing none, looks like we're ready to go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? No. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yeah. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 183 passes eight to one. And um, if the uh, folks from Room for Improvement are here, um, in chambers or on Zoom, thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. Will the clerk please read order 184. Order 184, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of Allagash Brewing Company. Application is for outdoor dining located at, on private property at 100 Industrial Way, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you. Is there public comment on this order? Seeing none, I'll close public comment and come back to the council for a motion, please. Second. Councillor Ali with a second from Councillor Zaro. Are there, is there any council discussion on order 184? I see none, we'll go ahead and vote to approve. Councillor Fournier? 
Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevaro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. And Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 184 passes unanimously. And if the owners of Allagash Brewing are here with us tonight, thank you. And thank you so much for doing business in the city of Portland. Next, we move to budget items. So will a clerk please read order 185. Order 185, 22, 23, receiving and referring to the Finance Committee, the Portland Board of Public Education fiscal year 2024 budget estimate and setting a public hearing thereon, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you so much. And would you like to tee up what we're gonna do next? Certainly, I see our, our friends from the schools here this evening. Um, they will be presenting the uh, board approved budget um, that will be referred to the finance committee. And so I believe chair Sarah Lentz is here uh, to provide some information on what the board has looked at and what their recommendation is uh, to the council and the finance committee specifically, um, as long as co-superintendents uh, are, are also here as well. Um, and so I'm sure they'll assist as needed, but thank you so much for being here tonight and for all your work on this all uh, very much and uh, myself and the superintendents are going to be presenting uh, kind of a narrative of the budget that we're putting before you and I also just want to recognize the other board members that are in the room and online tonight. Um, this has been a very collaborative effort uh, so just want to recognize that across the board. So uh, without further ado, uh, Mayor Snyder and members of the Portland City Council. On behalf of the Portland Board of Public Education and in accordance with the city charter, I, along with interim co-superintendents Malia Nally and Aaron Townsend, are presenting our recommended fiscal year 2024 budget for the Portland Public Schools. The board approved this budget unanimously on April 12th, I'm sorry, April 11th. Our 143.8 million fiscal year 24 school budget is responsive to the incredible, vast, and often conflicting needs of the Portland Public Schools at a time of daunting budget challenges. We feel strongly that the budget we present to you today is fair and responsible given the current circumstances. This budget reinvests in core operations such as finance and human resources, while also investing in student-facing staff to support all of our students, including our many newly arrived multi-language multi learners. Within this budget, we've also done our best to anticipate and plan for the fiscal year 25 budget, when the district will no longer have access to federal COVID money and will likely face decreased funding from the state level. This budget does all that while simultaneously being mindful of the tax burden on Portland residents in a year when inflation is higher than most can remember. We began the fiscal year 24 budget process facing formidable fiscal challenges. Inflation and other factors resulted in higher costs, coupled with an unexpected $2.4 million loss in state subsidy and other revenue adjustments, Initially, it would have required us an 8.7% tax increase just for our rollover budget. Adding in other important programmatic budget needs and requests would have required a tax rate increase of 15.5%. Instead, the budget we present to you tonight entails a 5.7% increase in the school tax rate. The process to get to that figure, though, has been thorough and demanding. This budget is the result of many months of hard work on the part of the board and district and school leaders and staff. It reflects many difficult choices informed by voices across our community through public hearings, emails, and conversations with the mayor and city councilors. While we tried to uphold as many as we could, ultimately many investments have not been included in this budget. Our recommended budget does, however, meet our three key priorities for the 2023-2024 school year. Those priorities are maintaining the commitment to the Portland Promise goals of achievement, whole student, and people, all intertwined with the fourth central goal of equity, being responsive to the needs of all students, especially those newly learning English, and improving operational effectiveness in such areas as finance and human resources. Our budget is also responsive to Portland taxpayers, making use of a significant portion of previously unanticipated funds from a higher state subsidy than expected and a healthcare savings to reduce the impact on the school tax rate. 
We learned on March 28th that the state had miscalculated its education aid to local school districts and that our district's fiscal year 24 adjusted subsidy would actually be $3.6 million more than expected. The initial budget proposal from co-superintendents Nali and Townsend on March 17th was built on information from the state that we would receive $2.4 million less in state aid than in fiscal year 23. So this additional net of $1.2 million more in state subsidy was very welcome news. In addition, our health insurance rates were recently confirmed as lower than budgeted, resulting in another $400,000 in savings. Our budget uses more than $1 million of these unanticipated funds to reduce the impact on local taxpayers, with the rest used to preserve core programming. When the board approved this budget on April 11th, it was expected that our budget would result in a 6% increase in the school portion of the tax rate. However, the district learned today, April 24th, that as a result of an update to the city's property valuation estimate, our budget's impact on the tax rate will now be lower than 6%. Our recommended one, this is, this is a tricky number, so one, uh, 143 million, $810,343 budget for fiscal year 24, which is up $10.7 million over this year's budget, now calls for a 5.7% increase in the tax rate. That is in line with inflation. It also is a significant downward revision from our original 15.5% needs assessment increase. The 7% increase in our superintendent's initially proposed budget on March 14th and the 6.1% increase our board finance committee recommended on April 3rd. Our budget would raise the overall school tax rate by 40 cents for a total of approximately $7.5 per $1,000 valuation. It would increase the annual tax bill for the median family in Portland valued at $375,000 by $150 per year or $12.50 per month. In the spirit of our collaboration with the council throughout the fiscal year 24 budget process, the 5.7% school tax rate increases our budget, um, increase in our budget is within the five to 7% range of budget guidance provided to us by city councilors. Good evening, everybody. Um, so our budget uses the remainder of the unanticipated new revenues to preserve core programming and enable flexibility in managing the challenging budget outlook for the FY25 budget. That upcoming budget year is expected to be particularly difficult because our district will no longer have available ESSERF, which is the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, money granted to school districts during the COVID pandemic, even though the effects of the pandemic continue to remain. And we could have less state education aid due to the city's continued rising property valuations. To help prepare for FY25, we are beginning work to initiate strategic, significant cost savings structural changes while continuing to advocate at the state level for adjustments to the state funding uh, formula. With the additional unanticipated revenues for FY24, we were able to make a number of revenue and expenditure investments um, and adjustments to the budget that was originally proposed. For example, our budget returns community coordinator positions, which uh, are the people who manage the volunteer program at the local schools, back to the local budget, and returns a number of core services that have been shifted to ESSERF in earlier stages of the budget. These include math coaches in elementary and high school, um, elementary and high school classroom teachers, high school youth development positions, and adding a literacy teacher leader, and the equivalent of 1.5 positions to human resources and a grant accountant to further support improvements to our operations and finance teams. Such local budget investments um, serve to free up about 2.8 million of resources and remaining ESSER funds to invest in key budget priorities for next year. The revised ESSERF budget contains additional investments to advance elements of the Portland Promise strategic plan in the next year. These include additional resources for summer learning, curriculum, and staffing. Our budget also includes additional investments to be able to address the influx of newly arriving students with intensive language development needs. These investments include adding additional language capacity at the school and district level, 
as well as providing for additional instructional capacity to serve students, including a dual language learner teacher at the pre-kindergarten level. In addition, the budget contains funds to support non-ESOL, and that's English for speakers of other languages, educators to acquire their ESOL credential as we take steps towards supporting all PPS educators to have the skills and knowledge to differentiate from multilingual learners. Other key highlights of our budget include increased investments in district employees that total just over $4 million to help attract and retain staff during the nationwide labor shortage and to ensure hardworking employees can meet the inflation driven costs they face every day. We settled contracts this past fall with bargaining units representing teachers and educational technicians that included wage increases. I'm gonna pass it over to co-superintendent Townsend to share the additional detail. Good evening, everybody. Uh, higher operational costs are also a part of our budget. Due to staffing turnover and shortages and systemic problems with our payroll system, the district had difficulties beginning last fall in paying all of our more than 1,500 employees in a complete and timely way. While most of the immediate problems have been resolved, we continue to work on a long-term solution by outsourcing payroll, a move recommended by the recent audit um, from Spinglass. The budget includes about $775,000 to cover the costs of hiring payroll processor ADP and increasing staff in the finance and human resources departments, also recommendations in the audit, as well as for shoring up transportation facilities and school meal services. The budget also uses ESSERF money to add a few one-year-only positions to address class size challenges at a few grade levels and a few elementary schools to maintain our ratios in grades K through three. It also includes additional resources for, uh, the, for the equivalent of 1.5 new teaching positions at Portland Adult Ed to respond to significant demand for programming. PA, he may choose to use some of that funding in the short term to provide more compensation towards hourly teachers for the preparation work they do outside of the classroom. This budget also reflects an increase of $2 million for out-of-district special education costs for students whose specific IEP needs the district is unable to meet in its schools. These costs are required by law. It also includes debt service costs for the renovations to the four elementary schools and the Buildings for Our Future bond approved by Portland voters in 2017. Lysith Elementary was renovated in 2020 and renovations to a second school, Presumpscott, will be completed this spring. The remaining two schools, Reiki and Longfellow, are less than a year away from completion. Through careful financing and use of reserves, the district has been able to defer the impact of debt payments for these projects over time, but this budget does include a $2.2 million increase in debt service for fiscal year 24. In summary, our budget is a balanced and reasonable one, it invests in all our students, including our newly arriving multilingual learners, provides, provides fair compensation for our hardworking staff, ensures up core operations, including finance and human resources, while being mindful of taxpayers. As we stated earlier, there are still a lot of needs not fully resourced in this budget, but it accomplishes some important goals, and we are confident it is the best we can do under the current fiscal circumstances. We ask you to join us in supporting this budget and sending it to Portland voters for final approval on June 13th. The Portland community has shown at the polls year after year that they believe strongly in the, important, in the importance of public education and also in the goal of the Portland Promise to make sure that all of our students are prepared and empowered for college and career. This budget reflects those values and we encourage you to approve it. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. It's good to see you. We appreciate you taking the time um, and sharing the information with us that you have. Um, I do want to, before we go to public comment, I wanna remind people that tonight's public comment is on the council's motion to receive and refer. So we're not actually taking public comment on the content of the Portland Public Schools budget tonight. We're taking public comment on the council's action to receive and refer um, and uh, what we're doing is referring this to the um, uh, to the finance committee um, that will continue the work. So that's an opportunity for engagement and um, uh, input on that on that budget. But just a reminder. So I open it up for public comment on order 185. Uh, again, the council's action to receive and refer. And we'll go to Christian Mill Neal on Zoom. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Uh, Christian Milneal, 
resident of 45 Smith Street in the East Bayside. Um, thank you for all, especially the school board, for your work on this. I just wanted to encourage the city council to push back a little bit on the school board and ask them to restore all the student facing positions, especially at Reiki and uh, East End School, which I think we all know are gonna expect a huge influx of asylum. Hey Christian, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. We're just taking public comment on the council's motion to receive and refer. This sounds like we're getting into the content of the budget, which we'd be happy to get an email or come to a finance committee meeting, or on sure, May 1st, sure. we'll have a public hearing on the school I will, budget uh, I, will, I will do that, but uh, I just wanted to uh, let the whole council know that, uh, you know, I'm hoping that we can be more ambitious in the context of the asylum seekers we're expecting uh, to come into the school system next year uh, to you. really make sure that they're fully staffed. On the topic of the tax burden, I also just want oh, to- Oh, sorry, say, here we yeah. go. So we're back. Uh, the council's action tonight is receiving and referring. So we're not talking about the public comment tonight is not focused on the content of the school's proposed budget. That's yep. what we- I just have a we'll general have comment on here. the city budget. Oh, just a general we're not comment doing on the that. You're not doing that either. <laughs> So Sorry. I'm, I'm confused. I can't, I can't speak on uh, any subject that's not directly related to the motion at hand. Right. In this particular instance, we already took public comment on items that are not on tonight's agenda. So the item on tonight's agenda is a receiving and referring right. motion. But please know there will be plenty of opportunities to provide comment on the specifics of both the school budget and the city budget. I will follow up with an email to the full city council. Uh, but Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any any public comment on the uh, motion before the council this evening? Councilor Rodriguez, I think you had a hand up. No, I was just going to ask okay. for the dates of when public hearings would be taking place. So yep. remind folks. Yep. So that um, uh, in our packet, uh, we've got the uh, first reading and public hearing of the FY24 school budget um, is going to actually be held next week on May 1st. And then we'll have a second hearing and another public hearing here at the council on May 15th. So we will have the opportunity to, to, to do two full public hearings. Um, and Councilor Dion, I'm gonna put you on the spot and ask you, once this is referred to the Finance Committee, do you wanna to speak to any uh, work that's upcoming in the committee um, to get this voted out and over to the um, Council? You have put me on the spot. Sorry. Yeah. Look, the committee will go through its normal process. We'll, we'll take a look at the budget. We'll accept public comment. I've already started receiving emails uh, for constituents advocating for increases in the school budget. I've received some that are asking us to slash the budget. Uh, so it seems like a typical year, but I will say what is different for the committee moving forward is uh, the experience we had during this cycle, working in collaboration with our colleagues at the Board of Education, the Finance Committee, their chair, the chair of the Board of Education itself and the superintendent. So I think I am I can say with confidence that we have a better understanding of the school budget process and the contents of that budget than we had previously experienced in other budget cycles. So from that point of view, thank you uh, to everyone that I've mentioned from the school side of the uh, process. So we will move accordingly. Um, there is a timeline that we have. I don't have it at my disposal. We will stay on time. The train will get here to the council and you can vote it out accordingly. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Diane. I appreciate your work. I was just going to follow up and, and provide you with this schedule. It is on the city's website under the Finance Committee webpage. And so specifically, you'll see that the um, Thursday the 27th is the night that we'll be taking up uh, the vote on the, the public hearing uh, for the, the school's budget. And then it walks through specifically the, the meetings in May that we'll be taking up the budget for the city or the city side of the budget. So it's all um, right on that finance committee web, uh, sub page and you can find all of the dates and information there. Great, thank you. Councilor Diane, do you, yep. I was just gonna say thank you. Okie doke. Uh, okay, so additional public comment on the on order 185 motion to refer. Okay, I, I do not see any new hands up. Um, uh, so I'll close public comment um, and I'll come back to the council for a motion. Motion to refer. Second. 
Councillor Diane with a second from Councillor Rodriguez. Is there any council discussion uh, before we go ahead and vote on this motion? Again, I do want to thank um, co-superintendents Nally and um, uh, Townsend for being here tonight, as well as Chair Lentz. And I see many other school board members out here in the audience and also on Zoom. So thank you again for your time, for all the work that you've done. Hopefully there's a little relief in tonight, um, knowing that you're passing it over and we will take it up from here and we'll look forward to um, you know, hearing from our community just one week from tonight. Um, so thank you again. And I think we're ready to go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chavarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 185 passes unanimously. Thank you again. And we will move on. We have Order 186 before us. Will the clerk please read that order? Order 186, 22, 23, receiving and referring the city manager's recommended fiscal year 2024 municipal budget to the finance committee and setting date of public hearing on fiscal year 2024 municipal budget and the fiscal year 2024 appropriation resolve sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. So uh, we're finally, finally here. Um, I was just saying today that I feel like I've been working on this for three months because uh, I have, and I know this is the first time all of you are seeing this um, after a great, great deal of work. Um, I put in front of you uh, the FY24 budget um, and includes a 6.1 uh, tax rate increase. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit of the, the history and specifics. Um, the, all of the materials obviously are in the backup and we're, we're just referring this to the finance committee so that the committee can really dive into the department specific uh, information and details. Uh, throughout the month of May, but as you all recall, when we uh, started this, um, the uh, rollover budget, as I like to refer to it, had a 14% increase that would have been um, very significant, and I heard clearly from the council uh, through your guidance back in March that you would obviously rather see, and uh, clearly all of you unanimously would rather see, a 5 to 7% rate increase that we would uh, send to the uh, taxpayers of the city. So um, we went back to work, the finance and budget team, um, and really worked hard. We had to shave about $11 million off of what was in front of us and uh, come back to you um, with that 6.1% uh, tax rate increase. And it was extremely complicated and difficult. Um, some of the, the challenges we faced which I know we talked about back in March, were um, the expiration of some one-time funding uh, that we received from the state last year, 7.4 million to address the asylum seeker issue um, and expenditures related to that. We had a reduction of 1.7 million in state revenue sharing. Um, we also, as you all know, um, are phasing out our use of ARPA funds, our federal funds. And so this is the last year we'll be able to use those and we're using uh, less of those than we have in previous years. And then the last, um, I think, really significant hurdle that we continue to face, as we've talked about a lot, is staff vacancies. We've been running roughly 250 staff vacancies pretty consistently uh, this year. So it's, it's extremely difficult to, to manage that and try to deliver all of the services to everyone in the city um, within the, the confines of what we um, have put forward today. Um, to go back to that that initial uh, asylum seeker and slash homelessness uh, issue that we've been facing, it's a very obviously unique challenge that we have been facing on, um, and I think one obviously that the country is facing at a national level, but obviously is a very dire situation as we've talked about here. Um, we've uh, recently opened the expo. Um, we reached capacity within a week of opening the expo. We have are still operating a family shelter that's completely at capacity. And our uh, brand new uh, homeless services center um, is also at capacity. We are with all of those facilities and with our um, use of a couple of hotels within the city, we are housing about 1200 people a night. Um, and so that's a significant issue that we face on a regular basis. We focused because of those issues, a big chunk of this budget on providing social services, emergency shelter, public health, and, um, and other care to our neediest and most vulnerable population. 
Um, it's important to remember uh, that we uh, shoulder 30% um, of that cost uh, to provide those services. 70% uh, is provided through that state general assistance program um, that still gives us a significant expense to bear. And so considering the numbers that we are seeing, so we have been working, um, the mayor, myself, the legislative committee, as well as our delegation, very, very um, focused and significantly over the past uh, couple of months to, to try and re uh, work with our legislative delegation and legislators in Augusta to get additional funds to address that significant need. So one thing you'll see right off the bat in this budget I put before you is that I make a presumption that we're going to receive those additional funds. And that's of significant note because that's a $4.2 million assumption. Um, it's a significant assumption and I want to draw it to everybody's attention because it will mean um, we would be passing out a much more significant tax rate increase to the taxpayers if we don't, if we weren't making that assumption. Um, the tax rate increase, as I mentioned at the beginning, was 6.1%. If we, if we aren't able to secure those funds, we would be looking at a 10.4% increase. So um, that is, that's significant. And it's either that that would either be the increase or we'd have to go back to the drawing board with the finance committee and look at ways to reduce expenditures. Um, Another thing this year, as I mentioned, we have the ability to use ARPA funds. Um, we are using about 4.75 million this year. And that, um, that obviously has helped reduce the impact as well. Um, we will not have that uh, ability next fiscal year. Every year, department directors um, take, uh, take a significant amount of time to really look at their budgets and determine the best way that they can continue to provide those services and achieve cost savings. They really, really did an amazing job this year of trying to do that. Um, we really worked hard to reduce existing expenses um, while at the same time making sure that we are continuing to provide and um, have a, a sufficient full-time equivalent employees and staffing needs being met. Um, that's a significant focus for us, given, the, given those recruitment and retention issues I've talked about. Um, and also, I think I heard that from you all uh, during our discussion in March um, about the need to continue core municipal services providing those. I understand you all have a slightly different definition potentially of what that means, but making sure that we do that, um, obviously we need those employees. So that has been a focus of all of this to try to deliver that budget within those boundaries that you set, but continuing to make sure that we have the staff and support the staff that we have currently um, to be able to provide those services. Um, I. Just, you know, I think that, that that's sort of a summary of where we're at. Like I said, we'll get really into the details of each of the various departments and this, um, the specific highlights of what we're proposing. Um, I just wanted to go over just a little bit about FY23, just as a recap for you. I think some of the big highlights that you'll see, obviously we opened the Homeless Services Center, which was extremely um, important and also reflects some changes that you're gonna see in this FY24 budget. Some of the big um, cost drivers, obviously the Health and Human Services Department is a um, significant portion of this budget. And um, those changes uh, at the Homeless Services Center and those costs are reflected um, in that budget specifically. Um, we also had a uh, significant number of housing units that were approved through the Planning and Urban Development Department. Um, approximately 1,500 housing units are under construction. Of course, that's the product of a significant amount of review and work done by staff um, over just the past uh, few years. Um, additionally, some other big things, as you all know, uh, housing and housing availability has been a focus for the, um, for the council and for city staff as well. Um, and so we continue uh, to work on with the housing staff uh, ways in which to make sure we can open up all of those funds that you programmed over to the, um, through ARPA to the housing department. So we're well underway in that process. Permitting and inspections uh, continues to see its workload increase. So you'll see in this budget this year as well that we have put forward additional staff to address those needs. 
Um, obviously, we weren't able to do a lot of additional staff, very few additional staff ads across the board. Um, permitting and inspections, that department is one department in which we did provide additional staffing to address the citizen initiative changes um, as well. You'll, uh, also, I, I see Paul Bradbury out in the crowd tonight. Um, he must have been here specifically to remind me uh, to shout out for the Jetport. Um, they continue uh, its record for customer service in 2022, winning um, the easiest airport journey and most dedicated staff in North America awards. I mean, Paul, thank you very much for being here tonight. That's a great award and happy to, to shout all the great team out there out at the Jetport. Um, and then we continue in, in this budget, you'll see reflected, and I know in this past year, we've really focused on continuing to focus on our, um, our sustainability and one climate future goals. Um, we have uh, focused a lot and achieved a lot of successes already, but we'll continue to work on our Electrify Everything um, uh, program, as well as Electrify Bikes, I know is coming in the future, and DIY Electrify as well. Um, we continue to uh, uh, deploy our EV charging uh, stations and infrastructure throughout the city. And um, we'll be launching a summer long campaign to educate the public about the city's land care ordinance. So there's a lot of different things going on in that department as well, um, as well as our parks, rec and facilities department, which also um, has worked to uh, make uh, you know, obviously addressing our parks a priority, which is their focus, but you'll see in this budget this year that I've put forward one additional staff person, um, an assistant parks director to help them to be able to move along a lot of the projects that they have on their plate um, so that we can see more of those park improvements come to fruition throughout this uh, upcoming fiscal year. Um, I think those are the, the big highlights. Um, I just would note, obviously we have included in the budget um, specific monies for, uh, as I mentioned, the, the citizen initiative uh, ordinance um, to address those needs, but also the charter, uh, the passage of the various charter provisions. Specifically, I would like to highlight, you'll see a, a significant increase in the city clerk's budget um, to address uh, the clean elections program. We have included um, right now 260,000 as was proposed, uh, plus a $30,000 one-time allocation for the um, software or for the database uh, specifically. So there's $290,000 in that. Um, we've also uh, addressed uh, various other, um, uh, you know, wage adjustment issues and things that we're contractually obligated to in a wage adjustment line and, uh, and various uh, specifics. You'll notice uh, all those various um, additions on page, pages seven and eight of the budget letter. Um, I think that is the, in conclusion, I just want, I just want to give a big shout out to Brendan O'Connell. Um, he's our finance director and his team and all of the budget team and the department directors who've worked really hard to try to put this together to bring this in within your guidance um, and really look forward to addressing and, and answering all the questions and really getting into the details of every department with you all um, in the upcoming months uh, in, in May specifically with the finance committee. Um, uh, and I also will just, uh, it would be remiss to not recognize all the various city employees that work so hard every day to make sure that all of the services that are reflected in this budget are delivered in a, in a wonderful way and, and get done. I know Councilor Ali shouted out um, a Parks Rec and Facilities uh, employee this evening. And I just wanna indicate that that's just uh, most employees that I work with with the city, that that's what they do every day. They go above and beyond. So thank you so much for all the work that they do. And I really look forward to discussing this all further with you uh, in the Finance Committee. Thank you very much, Interim City Manager West, for that, teeing that up. Again, we're, we've got what we've got in front of us tonight is a motion to, um, or an action uh, to, to receive and refer. Um, but uh, we have a couple of things to do before we get to that. So I am uh, obligated um, it, within the charter to make some comments tonight, which I'm prepared to do. I won't take too long um, because we've got a, a ways to go on our agenda tonight, but I did wanna take this opportunity and offer some comments um, from my perspective. Uh, so the um, first of all, I wanna say thank you to the interim city manager who has been at it now for 17, if not 18 months um, in this interim role. It's a big lift. This is your second budget. 
as our interim city manager. And it is, uh, these are not easy times. Um, and so I wanna start by thanking you um, because it's no exaggeration that you've been, you have been focused on this for three months now, if not longer, and I see it every day. Uh, so thank you. Um, I also know that there's so many staff people that support the city manager's work to put this before us tonight. You mentioned Brendan O'Connell, you mentioned various directors, Paul Bradbury's here with us. If you're in chambers, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shout it out. Um, so I, I, I just wanna start with thanks because I know that everybody takes time from their normal everyday work and makes sure that they're focusing on the municipal budget development um, during these winter and spring months so that um, both the council and of course the community have an opportunity to understand what's going on. It really is a very, very big lift. Um, we, uh, I wanna also thank you for the inclusion of me and the council. Um, you're required to work in partnership with me um, on this uh, budget document, uh, and, and we do that work together, and I appreciate that. I also know that you engage each and every one of the counselors one-on-one, -on -one, and that's really important work. I also want to um, mention that um, I believe that tonight's um, budget presentation from our manager is a very clear response to the council guidance that was given um, at, at various times, but certainly in uh, workshops where we were discussing um, the budget and where the manager sought our guidance. And so I don't want that to go um, unsaid that there's a whole lot of work to get within the guidance that we provide. And so it's a, it's a way to say, thank you for taking that seriously. And thank you for being so responsive to our priorities. Um, so as I got ready to make these comments, as I do every year, I sit down and I, I try to read as much as I can about where we've been and what's the context that we're heading into. And I'm really not looking to make specific comments tonight on, um, on the budget itself, but but because uh, we'll have the opportunity to do that. But I started looking uh, at the past few years and the comments that um, that I'd given on this night in past years. And I came across my notes from last year and it struck me that I could have just taken those and read them tonight, because a lot of things haven't changed. We are still very much in a transition to what will be as a result of COVID. There are so many things that have impacted our budget and our work together broadly um, that you know, we haven't recovered from um, and that we are still working through. So one of the things that I highlighted last year, and this is a quote from my, my statement last year was, the biggest factor in this year's budget is the HHS budget and how we as a community plan to be compliant with the state of Maine's general assistance obligation, which is currently 70-30. That's still true. <laughs> I also shared this, that we're very grateful for action by both the governor and the legislature that seeks to address with one time or one fund um, investments in emergency, temporary, and permanent housing. That's still true. As the manager mentioned, it is still our work while the legislature is in session to be keeping an eye every single day on what's happening up there and engaging as actively as we can on the issues that address us, namely general assistance and any other bills that have to do with housing. Um, I also shared this, the past eight months have proven to us that we can't know and we really can't predict the number of people with emergency needs and therefore the municipal obligation associated with our state's general assistance law. That's true. We've been talking about this since the fall of 2021. We can't predict it and we, can't, and we don't see a slowing down of the number of people coming to the city of Portland seeking asylum. That's a, whole, that's a whole realm of response that the city is constantly working to address. We just can't predict it. So again, that was last year's <laughs> sentence. It applies this year as well. Um, last year I said the city of Portland takes, we take our GA obligation very seriously. We have a dedicated HHS staff working under strain that is frankly unimaginable. Um, and that we have been told, this was, again was last year's words, we've been told repeatedly we can only offer the most basic supports at this point in time, we're at capacity. So as then, we are now at capacity. City of Portland's FY24 budget, FY23 budget rather, um, budgets for um, 
shelter beds for both individuals and, and family. Um, up until recently, we budgeted for 100 and, oh, how quickly we forget, um, 154 beds at Oxford Street, gosh, and 146 beds at the family shelter. Last month, we opened the Homeless Services Center and increased the number of beds by 54 for individuals to make 200 beds, 208 beds total out at the Homeless Services Center. And we continue to have our family shelter at 154 beds. We all know those beds are full. Those are what we budget for. That is the emergency shelter for which we budget for facility and staff. And yet the expo has been opened and has 300 people in it. And so the point that I'm making here is that we are constantly looking to stretch our budget and to stretch staff, because when we look at what we actually budget for our two municipally run shelters, one for individuals and one for families, it hasn't been able to meet the need by far for so long. And so we don't change our budget when we accommodate another 300 people at the expo, but we have to figure that out. In this case, I wanna shout out to the community that has been hugely generous with volunteer time and funds raised um, in response to that um, community, community fund um, to help us run the expo. Um, but, that, but that's brand new. And I just wanna call out that the city has been doing this um, all year, uh, making sure that uh, we are responding as well as we possibly can, and in conjunction with community partners who are um, also stretched thin, but doing such important work. And I send my thanks out to all of them who help us respond um, uh, in, in, in moments of critical need, um, which it's, is always the case. Um, so um, with regard to, um, I mean, uh, we have incredible, challenges when it comes to the need for emergency shelter and homelessness. And I wanna call out um, departments of the city that are constantly on call, Health and Human Services, Department of Public Works, Parks and Rec, Fire, Police, and all the city employees who help to work our small city respond to the needs and the resulting challenges. It touches, I think, every single department in the city, some more than others, um, but it's, it's, a, it, it's significant and it's worth, uh, it's worth noting. Um, so as we've heard, there have been challenges to revenue. There are changes from FY23. We'll get into that as a group within the Finance Committee's work and when we deliberate here as a council. Um, these challenges include the fact that we have had some one-time or limited term revenues that have concluded or will be concluding. So we wanna keep our, easy, our eye on that. Um, we know this isn't going to be an easy budget to navigate. Um, there are so many needs and priorities. Um, our council stated priorities focus on homelessness, housing, sustainability, and climate. And of course, our budget, um, always with a, a, a lens, always using a lens that prioritizes racial, social, and justice equity. Um, so we have, we have a challenge in front of us. We've got the city manager's budget that came in at 6.1%. Um, and so where do we go from there? Um, it's, I know that it was a challenge to get there. And so I look forward to working with you all as we navigate our own priorities and the council's stated goals and priorities. Um, other challenges include the fact that we have incredible employee vacancies. So we have to focus on employee recruitment. I also think we need to focus on employee retention and investment in our employees. Um, as policymakers, we count on city staff every day to implement the work that we contemplate here in chambers. Um, so that's so important for us to keep in mind as we look at our budget and how we support the work that we all do for the community. Um, and of course, as was mentioned, we've got charter amendments uh, that happened uh, that were approved at the polls this past November, and we prioritize making sure that those voter approved changes um, are supported through our budget and that those changes are reflected through dollars that are, are put, um, uh, put in support of those uh, voter approved initiatives. Um, so lastly, I just wanna thank um, my colleagues on the council for the hard work um, that you all do. Um, and that the hard work that we will continue to do together between now and June 5th, when we take final action on the municipal budget. I wanna thank Councillor Dion for your work as the finance committee chair. I know you've got a big lift over the next six weeks. So I appreciate that. Is it six weeks, seven, maybe eight? You got this. Keep, keep adding. Just... You, got, you got this. 
Um, members of the finance committee, thank you. I know that you're, you know, you're obligated to be there at each meeting, so I really appreciate that. Um, and again, as was mentioned, we'll continue this work on Thursday evening at five o'clock at the finance committee. So thank you again. And that concludes my comments. Okay. So here we are again, public comment on uh, the council's motion to refer um, and uh, to receive and refer. So I will open up my Zoom screen to see if any, anybody is here to comment on the council's action to receive and refer. Uh, we have a hand up on Zoom and I'll go to Christian Mel Neal um, on that council action. Again, not the content of the budget, just the motion in front of the council. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. And I'll stick to the topic at hand on the subject of referring this uh, item to the finance committee so that the mayor won't have to interrupt me so much this time. Um, so when you're when the full council is referring uh, a budget like this to the committee, this is a great time for all the city councilors, especially those who aren't on the finance committee, to provide some direction to your colleagues who are on the finance committee so that when it does come back to the full council, this we are all on the same page and we know that this actually does reflect the realities and the priorities of the full city council. So I would love to hear from the full city council um, some feedback and some direction to the committee as they refer this item to let us know, does this budget in fact uh, reflect the city council's priorities? Does it treat homelessness and the climate emergency as the priorities that uh, that they deserve in the in the budget, um, or um, you know, would they, are there city councils who are, uh, would like to offer some guidance and and uh, more direction to the finance committee? So I would love to hear that at that point. I think this would be a great early opportunity for councilors to provide some feedback uh, and help set up the finance committee for some success. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Other public comment on tonight's motion to re receive and refer. Stephen Sharp of Bracket Street. I support the motion to refer to committee. I don't necessarily support the content of the budget, um, but uh, just uh, want to um, uh, point out one thing. There's a very nice chart in the middle of the budget um, narrative from the uh, interim city manager. And I would like that to be put on your Facebook page for the whole uh, community to see. Because the important thing of that chart is it shows that this budget is gonna go up, the entire city budget is, the tax burden is gonna go up by $14 million. And I think that's a significant point to be made in terms of the city budget and the school budget and, and the tax burden put on by the county that never gets talked about. So um, the last thing I wanna, the, um, there was supposed to be a finance committee meeting tomorrow night, that apparently has been canceled. And according to the agenda page, it's there but canceled and secondly thursday night's meeting has no agenda attached to it no uh, uh details as to what you're actually covering at thursday's meeting so that should be put up online tomorrow morning uh, so it's uh, available to the public thank you thank you for your comment uh other public comment on order 186 I do not see any, so I'll close public comment and I'd like to come back to the council for a motion, please. Second. Councilor Ali with a second from Councilor Zaro. Any council discussion? Councilor Dion. Uh, just a quick, a quick comment in response to the, um, the statement made by the Zoom participant. Mm -hmm. it, it's a practice of the finance committee while I've been chairing it for two years and a member for three years, is all city councilors are invited to attend. Many do. Uh, their insight, their opinion, their conclusions about what sound budgeting uh, allocation should be are taken into the fold by the committee as a whole. So we don't practice in isolation and then report out to the city council as a whole. As a matter of fact, it's been my goal uh, to make sure that when we bring back a final budget, everyone's pretty much aware where we're going with that particular document and what the consequences will be. So uh, if counselors want to lobby the committee, uh, that's part of the process and we welcome it. Uh, it's a no surprise budget procedural. So I just wanted to put that out there in case someone 
thought we did operate behind a curtain. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dion. And just a quick reminder to everybody that um, the first read and public hearing will happen on May 15th. The second read and public hearing and council action will happen on June 5th. Okay, I think we're ready to go ahead and vote. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yay. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Chabarro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 186 passes unanimously again. Thank you very much. Interim City Manager West. We will move on to um, the next item on our agenda. Will the clerk please read communication 32. Communication 32, 22, 23, amended rental golf cart rules and regulations by Daniel West, Interim City Manager. Um, this just uh, updates the rules uh, with regard to golf carts, uh, primarily um, well within the city, but mostly operated primarily on the islands. Um, this is just to update the council on those amendments, and it includes uh, clarification of processes um, by which the rental uh, golf car registrations are renewed and transferred, as well as how um, the administrative rules will be shared with the public. If you have any questions, um, be happy to answer them, but all the materials are in the backup. Uh, great, thank you. So we do have this communication in our agenda packet. As this is a communication, we don't take public comment or have any council action, but if anybody has any questions um, or comments, uh, now is the time. Okay, I don't see any hands up by my colleagues, so thank you for the communication. Um, appreciate that, and we'll move on. Will the clerk please read Resolution 8? Resolution 8, 22 opposing federal preemption of municipal pesticide regulations, sponsored by Sustainability and Transportation Committee. Andrew, Andrew Zaro, Chair. Councilor Zaro. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so this item uh, is a resolution um, uh, that is uh, uh, in response to uh, right now at the US Congress, there's uh, consideration of the 2023 Farm Bill which uh, includes a range of policies related to ag, food, and land use. Um, if passed, it would prohibit uh, local governments from regulating pesticides. As you know, we actually voted last year to change our um, LMAC to, uh, sorry, our PMAC to an LMAC. So we just began that about a month ago. Uh, so uh, given this, uh, uh, we would like to, and I'm happy to read it if you would like me to, Mayor, uh, this resolution opposing federal preemption of local pesticide ordinances. Would you like me to read it? I don't think you have to read the whole resolution unless you'd like to. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to save my voice this evening. <laughs> but if anyone has any questions, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and I would really appreciate the full council's support on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for offering that um, context and introduction. Before I come to the council for any Discussion, I'll see if there's any public comment on order uh, resolution eight. Okay, I don't see anybody in chamber stepping forward. I see no hands on Zoom, so I'll close public comment on resolution eight and I will ask please for a motion. Move passage. Second. Councilor Fournier with a second from Councilor Zaro. Is there any council discussion? Just a clarification, so, yeah. opposing the preemption, not the actual bill. Thank you for that clarification, Councillor Zaro. Any other discussion from the council before we act? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Chabarro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Uh, resolution eight passes unanimously. Uh, again, thank you, Councillor Zaro, for your introduction there. I see that we have Director Moon with us on Zoom, so thanks for being here. Um, Troy, I know you're always here in case we have any questions, so I appreciate that. Um, we'll head into unfinished business. Will the clerk please read Order 170? Order 170, 22, 23, accepting and appropriating Federal Aviation Administration administered airport improvement program and airport infrastructure federal fiscal year 2023 grants sponsored by Daniel West interim city manager. Come on up to the mic, Paul. That's why you're here. <laughs> Paul Bradbury, uh, the Jetport director is here this evening to uh, give you a little background on this item. Sure, I will be, thank you so much for your time and no, it was great to be here for the budget as well. But Paul Bradbury, airport director, 
this is a unique opportunity that we get every year for AIP. One unusual thing this year is that we have the bipartisan infrastructure law funds that are that AIG. FAA has to have everything as an acronym. So it's AIP Airport Improvement Program, AIG Airport Grant Program, which is backed by the bipartisan infrastructure law. So it gives us twice as much entitlement money this year, it did last year, and for the next three years, which is great to help us catch up on the safety and infrastructure needs at the jet port as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, twice as much entitlement funding each year to help us to catch up. So with that, I am here to answer any of your questions and really appreciate your consideration of this item. Thank you so much for being here, Paul. Um, is there any public comment on Order 170? I see none. I will close public comment and I'm going to come back to the council for a motion. So moved. Second. Uh, Councillor Ali with a second from Councillor Rodriguez. And now do we have any council discussion or questions on this item before you tonight? It's great news. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Paul, as always. I think we could just go ahead and vote to approve Order 170. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Sorry, Councillor Dion? Excuse yes. You. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevaro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 170 passes unanimously, even with Councillor Dion. And I will ask the clerk to please read Order 171. Order 171, 22, 23, amendment to Portland City Code, Chapter 9, regarding clean elections, sponsored by Kate Snyder, Mayor. Uh, thank you so much. So we've got, I think I'm going to look, look to Corporation Council um, for, for comment here, which may, I know may end up uh, with, well, Michael, will you take it away? Sure. Yeah, uh, this is mostly just a brief <clears throat> introduction. Um, as uh, I think everybody knows, um, last fall uh, um, or last year, the, the Charter Commission recommended an amendment to the Charter uh, to um, uh, add a clean elections uh, ordinance that was approved by the voters in November. Um, and so it was as uh, ballot question number three. Um, we've brought in outside counsel, Jim Katsafikas and Brandon Mazur to assist with this. Um, they've already worked tirelessly through several, uh, several uh, workshops. Um, this item, because we're going to be approving a, uh, an ordinance, requires two reads. The first read was at the last meeting. Uh, today's the second read um, and public hearing. And uh, I'll leave it in Jim and Brandon's capable hands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor Snyder, members of the council, Jim Katsapikas and Brandon Mazur from Perkins Thompson here is outside council for this project. This is an outgrowth of the charter, a uh, requirement of the charter that be a clean elections and a campaign finance uh, ordinance adopted by the council. So we started this process back on March 13th with the workshop, just a general overview of what this, uh, what this ordinance might look like. On March 27th, we presented a draft and uh, we used the Santa Fe, New Mexico ordinance and clean elections uh, law as, as starting points for an ordinance that would work uh, for, for the city of Portland. We were trying to mesh the requirements of a clean elections program with a couple of other things. One of them being campaign registration deadlines and reporting requirements under state law, and then your own community the charter required deadlines for getting nomination papers, filing them. So we're trying to run all three tracks on, on something that we hope will be coordinated. So we put together an initial draft that provided for one round of funding distributions would be distributed all at one time. We had used the main citizens for clean elections numbers as far as the amount of qualifying contributions, the, uh, the amounts that would be uh, distributed to candidates, the amount of seed money. And also we adopted from Santa Fe the idea of a proration so that the fund doesn't run out. If it's running low, then amounts that would go to candidates would be prorated. That's what we uh, brought in for the March 27 workshop. On April 3, there was further discussion of that. And there was focus on the amounts, the numbers of qualifying contributions, the amounts that go to candidates, and how many rounds of funding there might be. Would there be supplemental funding? And so the council reached consensus on a proposal that Councillor Trevaro had put together. That 
consensus is the basis of the draft that's in front of you tonight for first read that was in front, excuse me, on first read on the 10th and is before you tonight for consideration. And I'll just briefly outline some of those uh, features and then Brandon will be talking about uh, possible amendments and what these might do. The important things we think that the departures from that first draft that we brought in on the 27th would be these. First, this version in front of you right now reduces the overall number of uh, qualified contributions necessary for, to qualify for an initial round of funding. So for example, for mayor, it's 300 to 200 qualifying contributions to get that initial distribution. But I say initial uh, distribution because we've gone from one distribution to an initial and then three supplemental distributions. You have to get more qualifying contributions to, to unlock each of those, but you can get up to three supplemental uh, distributions on that. Also, at, uh, as was suggested, the date when you can begin receiving distributions is moved up. In our draft, it had been at the point where you submit your nomination papers, which would be as early as August 18. That would be the earliest, uh, the early, earliest you could get any funding. This moves up the initial distribution date to July 17, a month before people are qualified to be on the, on the ballot. So for that reason, you would have to sign an affidavit pledging to repay any amounts if, should you decide or should you not qualify as a candidate. Also with that initial distribution and the up to three uh, supplemental distributions, you'd have to qualify, you have, you have to submit more qualifying contributions for each to unlock each of those payments. There would be no proration under this. Instead, funding is first come first serve. And if the fund runs low or runs out, then candidates would be able to go, turn to private financing up to the amounts of the limited amounts for clean elections. So you'd go to private financing, but your total amount raised would still be the same as if you were in the program. There's an annual budget requirement. The council would be required to, uh, to pay $500,000, to appropriate $500,000 per year. Uh, please understand that there's a, a principle of municipal law and administrative law, congressional law, constitutional law, that one legislature can't bind future con uh, legislatures. So this year's council can't bind future year's councils to actually spend that amount. You can put that in the ordinance. It's not going to be enforced. So those are the features, the basic features of what we're dealing with here with this draft that's before you tonight. And I know there's been one uh, amendment that was submitted as part of and was included in your package. Uh, Brandon, would you like to talk, take us through that, please? Thank you, and we're here for any questions. And uh, I've circulated the packet. There was some comments made that it would be helpful to have the paper form. So that's what's in front of you. It's nothing that's outside the packet at this point. Um, and I also have um, a panelist uh, a capabilities on my laptop. So if there are any specific documents that we've talked about over the past workshops, I'm happy to share my screen and bring those up. Um, so uh, over the last, a uh, couple of weeks, we've uh, received one specific amendment that's part of the packet this evening from Councillor Favaro, um, which I know she's uh, joining remotely and can, can give further details. I wanted to give sort of a high level review of what that amendment seeks to do along with um, one other addition that, that we added with her permission. Um, so you'll notice um, that she, the amendment maintains the $500,000 budget amount as uh, Jim mentioned, in mayoral years and lowers that in non-mayoral election years to 250, no less than 250. Um, we also clarify uh, in conversations that uh, we had in our office with the city clerk's uh, office, clarifying the timing of the first round of distributions. Um, in our original draft, uh, we had it a little bit rigid that it would be no later than a certain date um, that initial distribution will actually be rolling. Uh, so putting that restriction on was a little bit too rigid. So with uh, Councillor Trevorrow's permission, we've added some language clarifying that it uh, would be as expeditiously issued as, as possible after certification, but no later than the date certain. And the other uh, aspect uh, which um, changes the, the proposal that you, you saw originally was the short shortfall provision. Uh, there's uh, 
under the original provision, it was a first come first serve uh, situation for the initial and supplemental funding. And after, if in the uh, instance that the there was a shortfall in the fund, then those candidates would be able to, in essence, collect their qualifying contributions, but then go and become, for lack of a better word, a traditional candidate raising up to that $500 amount. What uh, the Councilor Trevorrow's amendment seeks to do is <clears throat> creates a procedure that uh, requires the council by resolution to at least take up the option of uh, appropriating additional funds. Um, and in the event that additional funds are not appropriated, then that candidate would be able to go and be treated in essence as a traditional candidate. Um, there's some, some language in there uh, that I pulled directly from the budgetary process that's found online. So there's language of unencumbered, unencumbered funds um, that, that may be a foreign term, but it, it came straight from um, the city's process and procedures. We can tweak that language if needed to, to more accurately reflect, reflect the, the parlance uh, that's used. Um, and really that's, that is the uh, formal amendment before you. Um, we also have um, from the mayor uh, a proposal that wasn't officially part of the packet or an amendment, and I've got copies that I can circulate now, now at the appropriate time. Oh, that great, if you have copies, yeah. Okay, good. And just as an explanation, I think that um, I was working on this um, and finished it at 3.57 this afternoon, like two minutes before we went into executive session. So thank you for offering that uh, help to me. Um, as I, Do you want me to tee it up? If, it's up to you, Mayor. Yeah, I, I will. Um, so thank you for that. So again, um, I apologize to bring something from the floor. I welcome, um, or I, I appreciate your consideration. What I, what I have been trying to do, and I wish I could have gotten into it sooner, but um, was, oh, great. Okay. You don't have the, the little spreadsheet? No, Mayor. I do not do the, I do not do the Mayor. Uh, yes. Would it be possible for someone to email that to me? Oh, yes. Um, oh, yeah, we'll make sure that happens. Um, Brandon, is that something you could email to Councillor uh, Trevorrow? I can. It'll have to come from my Gmail account and not my office account, but I can try to... Okay, or I, or I can do it. I just want to take this opportunity. So um, so again, um, not always ideal to bring something from the floor, but that was my option. I just didn't have the time to, to get it out before before now. So, and here's, what, here's why I did this. I'll explain to you why I'm offering an amendment from the floor tonight. As I rewatched the workshop that we had as a group on uh, March 27th, um, and then I watched, no, March 13th, and then I watched the workshop on April 3rd. I, I steeped myself back in the original workshop documents that we had and the feedback that was given at that time. And what I looked at um, on April 3rd was the packet that was put together for the council's consideration that responded to the council's feedback at that time, which um, asked for us to contemplate lower distributed lower uh, low, lower distributions or uh, lesser funding um, in FY24, and so that that document was presented to the council on April 3rd at the workshop. It's in the backup material, and it has alternate proposals in the back. Um, so I, I I pulled that back up from your April 3rd the April 3rd workshop, and then I also listened to discussion at the April 3rd workshop that had to do with. Um, whether or not we've hit the right funding amount. And so I took a stab at this. You can take it or leave it. It's an amendment. I'm happy to put it before you. So I'm not gonna argue for it. I'm just gonna tell you what it is. So what I've done in this document here, which is the spreadsheet document, is I've reduced the amount of funding in FY24 from 500,000 out of the annual operating budget to $351,000. And I'll tell you, um, kind of rationale for where that came from. So the number of candidates was 
um, based on, from what I understand, looking back over the last 10 years and having a good sense of how many candidates qualify for uh, the local ballot. I think we got that from Maine Citizens for Clean Elections. Is that right? No, the number of candidates oh, the clerk's came from, office. from the clerk's office right. were reanalyzed. Okay. That's right. Okay, thank you. Um, so so the, the 16 um, candidates that are contemplated there was based on uh, an average over the last 10 years. Um, I then looked at um, the funding amounts that were in our April 3rd packet that came in response to the council's feedback from March 13th. And I looked at the alternate proposal one, which had a distributed amount of $75,000 for the mayor, $25,000 for an at-large city council candidate, $10,000 for, um, uh, for a district city council candidate. And then I actually increased what they had recommended from 5,000 to 7,500 because I listened to the feedback on April 3rd from counselors uh, um, with some concern about uh, too little funding for school board candidates. So I increased that from 5,000 to 7,500 and I stuck with the school board district amount of $3,000. And so what that did is it, um, it created a fund that would need $367,000. Um, of course, however we proceed, there's gonna be a certain number of qualifying contributions that would be an offset. Um, whether or not the council even wants to think about a change in the qualifying contributions, I did make some increases to what is in our first read, um, uh, or, or maybe, sorry, the better way to say that is I made some changes um, and uh, the qualifying contributions are, are laid out in such a way that, of course, we can, um, we can tweak as a group, um, whether or not we're, we're in the right place or not. Um, uh, but there, uh, that, that would bring in a certain amount of funding. So again, my intent here was to try to lower the overall annual operating budget allocation in FY24 from $500,000 down to $351,000. I know that um, the, the voters had a price tag of $260,000 that was in the Charter Commission's final report. And I know that that's what's in the city manager's budget. So trying to help us achieve um, that, uh, that different budget, um, that different budget approach. Again, for your consideration, I look forward to discussion of this amendment if you're interested and also other elements of what's before us tonight. Thank you. Just, just one point of clarification. The only change in the actual red line is the um, the monetary amounts? I did not adjust the qualifying contribution requirements, which would adjust the mayor's chart. Um, there were a few too many moving parts, and I and, I, and this may have been my mis miscommunication, mayor, but I only changed the num the the amounts. That's fine. I mean, I think I think that yeah, that that's fine. We can talk about it. It was really just an attempt again to find a kind of a compromise between the 260 and the 500. Um, Councillor Trevaro, I had a chance to speak to my amendments. I know yours were covered by uh, Mr. Mazur, but would you like to jump in there before we take public comment? Um, yeah, he covered them really well. Um, basically, I my original proposal had 500,000 allocated annually for this. And um, in looking at it, I don't think that that is going to be necessary. I think that that is really like an upfront cost. And so I changed it um, to just the mayoral years. And then after that, it would be 250 annually. Um, and then the other thing was basically um, to give the council an opportunity to replenish the funds if the um, fund ran out, if we under budgeted and candidates were left in that situation where they turned in all their clean election checks, they qualified for the ballot, they were due money, but we just didn't have the money in the fund to give them before they then turned around and started raising money privately, the council would have an opportunity to see if we can fund it from other sources um, to replenish that money and make good on um, what they've qualified for. So that was the thinking behind those. They're kind of, um, you know, little more just tweaks. Um, and yeah, that they're in the form of one amendment, but it really does sort of those two major things. Great. Thank you, Councillor Tavaro. 
Um, so at this point in the agenda, we will, um, we've got the uh, first read before us, we've got a couple of amendments. And so we'll take public comment on any of that content and uh, before we open it up for council discussion. So if you're yep, here in chambers and you'd like to step forward, go ahead and then we'll head over to Zoom where we've got a hand up. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you for your proposal, Councillor Tavaro's proposal. My name's Anna Keller. I'm the Executive Director of Maine Citizens for Clean Elections. And we are supporting the proposal that was brought to the first read and Councillor Tavaro's amendments today it is, it's our bottom line here is that this program needs to be successful in its first year. And successful means that candidates are able to trust that they can use the program, they will have enough money to run competitive campaigns, um, and that it will be well administered in the sense that they'll be able to understand what the rules are, how things are going to operate going in. All of that implies that there needs to be enough funding in this first year and not have doubt about it. So when we look at what's been historically spent in the last few years in mayoral races, we've had multiple candidates spending well over $100,000. We have seen that 80,000 is in some cases the smallest amount spent in a race, not the average or the largest amount. And so when we look at what's needed for this year and what's a reasonable estimate, knowing that we're, we're all making guesses at this point, there are a lot of things that we're trying to figure out that we simply don't know how they're going to turn out. It's better to overshoot. I say that knowing that this is a, a tough budget and that this is not, 500,000 is not the amount that was put in in the original proposal. That said, when we were thinking about this originally, we thought there would be years of the fund building up before we ever got to a mayoral race. So 500,000 in this first year, the fund will then build up. It is unlikely the candidates spend all of the money that they receive as when we look at the state, there's usually money returns to the fund at the end that helps to build it up year after year. This startup cost of having a higher amount this year is what will set us off on a good basis moving forward and it's unlikely to need to be repeated at that high level, even in another mayoral year in the future, if we can set it off well now. Um, again, thank you for the dedication and thoughtfulness that you're putting into this and um, happy to answer any questions if that's helpful later in the process. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And we'll head over to Zoom, Jay York. You with us, Jay? You'll have to unmute yourself on your end. Yes, Mayor, would this be an appropriate time to speak to the Pool and Housing Authority's uh, request to change the zoning for Franklin Towers? No, it isn't. We're actually in a different order right now on our agenda, and that will be coming up um, yeah. a little yeah. bit later in our agenda. Okay, thank you very much, Mayor. Okay, no problem. Any other public comment, either in chambers or on Zoom? Great. Good evening, Mayor, Councilors. I'm Ben Chipman. I represent uh, Portland in the Maine State Senate. I live on Mayo Street. Um, first of all, I'd like to start out with uh, just saying I have a significant amount of experience with clean elections. Uh, one of the first petitions I ever worked on when I was in college in 1995 was to establish the state system that we have now. Um, I've run for legislature seven times. I've used clean elections every single time, and I would not be a legislator if it wasn't for clean elections. I don't come from a wealthy family. I'm not connected to people with a lot of money, and I ran as an independent when I first ran, and didn't have any connection to party, didn't have a lot of people wanting to give me money. So without clean elections, I wouldn't even uh, be in the legislature. Um, I'd like to say, I guess there's been a little bit of, I think, confusion or misunderstanding maybe what, what clean elections is about. Uh, the purpose of clean elections is not necessarily reduce the amount of money spent in campaigns, although that's great if it does accomplish that. But the primary purpose is to reduce the influence of private money in our political system. So to have a system that's publicly funded where candidates are using that system so that when they're elected, they're beholden only to the voters, not to private donors and special interests. That's the primary purpose. Um, the need for funding in the campaign cycle early, I think is really important. And that's what I think is really good about the proposal that's on the table. It was uh, endorsed unanimously at the last workshop. Um, having that money 
come a little bit earlier in the middle of July as opposed to waiting to the end of August, early September um, is very beneficial. No serious candidate um, running for a citywide office um, this fall or in the future is gonna wanna use this if they have to wait till the end of August or early September to get their first disbursement. It's a lot that happens early on in campaigns that impacts the ability of a candidate to be successful in the end. Um, the timeline and plan endorsed by you last, at the last workshop strikes a good balance in three ways. First of all, the timeline of when funding is available, uh, the number of $5 qualifying contributions required to qualify for funding at each level of funding, that's based on the state system. If you look at the number of $5 qualifying contributions required and the amount of money that candidates get, they're very similar to what candidates for state senate or state house have to collect in order to receive funding. And the, finally, the amount of funding that candidates qualify for is also a good balance. And I'd like to talk for just a minute about um, the amount of money raised and spent in uh, campaigns here in Portland. Um, we've heard some comments the last workshops about um, the money being too much, particularly candidates for mayor raising and spending too much money. I agree. Um, I had a real problem with the amount of money raised and spent in the first mayoral race in 2011. And in 2015, um, the amount of um, 30 second warning money that candidates could um, receive from individuals is $850 per individual, $1,700 from a couple. I sponsored and passed a bill to reduce that to $500 because I thought it was too much, but we can't argue with the data. The amount of money that candidates have been raising and spending, particularly in the mayoral race, in 2015 averaged 125,000, in 2019 averaged $131,000. Despite the reduction in the campaign contribution amounts, that's what they raised and spent. And so if we want a system that candidates are gonna use, if we want our next mayor this fall to be, that he's elected to be beholden to the people and not to special interests, we need a system that they're gonna use. And having a system that has not insufficient funding, too many qualifying contributions and late distributions of funding, um, candidates won't use it. And I think we want a, can, a, a system that's gonna be successful. I think we want something that people are gonna use. And if we have all of our viable candidates for mayor so. or other offices not using this, I think it will be seen as a failure and that would be really unfortunate. I think we want this to be successful. And um, in order for it to be successful, we need- Thank you so much. Great. So I appreciate your time and sorry I went over by a few seconds. Thank you. Appreciate your comment. Thank you, Senator. Other comments on, uh, oh, I have so much paper here. Um, any other public comment at this time? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Seeing none, I will close public comment and I'm gonna come back to the council for a motion, please. Move passage. Second. I think I had a second. Sorry, Councillor Zara with a second from Councillor Fournier. Um, okay, and so we will open this up for um, council discussion. Like I said, as we know, we've got a couple of amendments before us, so we can uh, look to take those up as we often do initially and move on to the either amended or unamended um, uh, for street material. So I'll offer my amendment. Um, if anybody would wanna offer a second, we can discuss it. Second. Councillor Dion with a second. And uh, so that's open for discussion. And I'll, I'll weigh in with my, my I, guess, I guess what I would call my, my advocacy just for, for the amendment for your consideration. So um, hopefully I was clear in terms of where this came from um, and the spirit behind the amendment. Um, I think it, it's actually quite interesting to see, we got an email um, that came in at 425 this afternoon looking at historical data, thank you for that. Um, the winning candidate in 2015 uh, it looks like spent 61,000 um, in 2019, looks like I spent 72,000. So I actually think the historical data is an interesting um, snapshot at um, the, the funds raised in the last couple. There, was, there were more funds raised and it was certainly a competitive environment. Um, but I, I, again, I was trying to be sensitive to the conversations we had both on March 13th and then the conversation that I listened to on April 3rd, um, talking about the uh, annual operating budgets support for the new clean elections program and whether $500,000 was the right amount. So I put this, I put these numbers before you um, 
And thank you again, Brendan, Brandon, for your um, for your help in putting. I don't have the here we go the the red line and what that would look like. Um, so I um, it's a starting point. I, I know we're going to have lots of conversation as we get into the ordinance that's before us tonight. But um, I uh, again thank you for your consideration and any input you have. Uh, happy to hear it, Councilor Zaro. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think <clears throat> I'm going to try to speak obviously only to your amendment, but I think this does sort of apply to both of the uh, amendments that we're looking at. I think, well, first off, and I, I shared this with many folks this weekend as we were preparing for this week, the, uh, this meeting, uh, amendments on Friday and uh, from the floor make me feel like the work isn't done yet. And I believe we have a little bit of time before we have to have this vote, but I'm not going to lie. We have a lot of paperwork in front of us with a lot of red ink. And that tells me we're not there yet, but I'm noticing a lot of trends that is suggesting that we're, we're close. Uh, so I'm just gonna name that before I dive into any specific questions. I personally don't think we are there yet. Uh, I, I would be comfortable with moving this to next week. However, we, we should still have the conversation. So I think my first question that I will ask for both is can someone help me understand the process that's going to shorten the overlap between qualification for clean election that would give you, whether it's one round or the other multiple rounds, specifically the first threshold, that qualification where you receive your first amount, amount of funding and when you qualify for the ballot, because at this point, if we're looking at July 17th with the second one, Mayor, what is the date on your qualification? So I actually, the only change that I'm offering you tonight is financial. Okay, so the same date. So what is the difference, like how are we going to, the reason I'm asking that is because there's going to be about a, a three week period, three and a half week period, where someone might have funding, not qualify for the ballot, and then we are going to rely on an affidavit that someone's going to give that money back. And, and I guess, does that mean the clerk's job is to find them? Uh, can someone help me understand what we're looking at and then how we're going to fix it? I think we have to send that out on the ballot. Yes, ma'am. Could I, I, I'll just jump in there since we're talking about my amendment in particular, is that I intentionally didn't address all those other elements that are in the big red line document, which is the ordinance. So, because I think that we can talk about that during council discussion of um, the materials in the first read. So that's why I didn't call it out is because I just was focusing on this one element, knowing that we'll be talking about the whole ordinance as we go. Um, okay, then I'm, I'm happy to retract that inquiry at this point. So if we're looking just at your amendment and your numbers, um, I'm, I, am, I am somewhere in between where you are and where Councillor Trevorrow is. Um, I guess my question is, maybe for our, my colleagues, how do, we, how do we get there this evening if we have competing um, uh, numbers in front of us? So less of a question that has an actual answer and more of a, I think we need to uh, let this cook a little bit more. Okay, thank you, Councillor Zaro. I've got a hand up from Councillor Trevaro, and then I think my next hand is Councillor Dion. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry, it took me a second to unmute. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to make that clarification to see if you were changing any of the timelines, but it sounds, it sounds like you are not doing that. That's not, I, I, I think it's, it's something I'd really like to discuss, but um, I didn't prepare an amendment specific to those. So no, the only amendment that I'm putting before the council tonight would change the dollar distributions and the annual operating budget allocation in FY24. Okay. Um, so I definitely, um, I mean, this is the first time I'm seeing this amendment and just on a cursory glance, it does seem to significantly reduce the funding to a level that I feel is uncompetitive and will drive candidates from seeking to use the program. Um, so it's definitely not something I would support tonight, and they're probably not numbers that I would support overall. Um, and just to kind of answer Councillor Zaro's question about um, the timeline. So we discussed this extensively in workshop. The idea was to try to figure out some way that we can get an earlier disbursement to candidates before basically Labor Day. Um, you know, one data point that um, I've been shown was that in the last mayoral race, actually, um, 
actually Mayor Snyder's campaign had spent $15,000 or more actually by June 1st. And so the idea is if we're allowing privately funded candidates to spend money at any time, but we are not giving any disbursements to candidates that are clean election funding until basically Labor Day, that puts a huge disparity between clean and privately funded candidates. And I, I think it's our obligation to try to figure out some workable way for this program. And so the idea was that in future years, we would do an amendment to the charter to change the ballot qualifying deadline so that it didn't have this sort of archaic uh, timeline that you can't turn in signatures until uh, the end of August and that would fix it, but that for this year only, you would be able to sign an affidavit that would allow you to get clean election funds once you qualify at a slightly earlier date of July 15th, which is still quite a bit later than spending actually occurs, has been occurring in the traditional campaigns in the last two cycles. Um, but the risk, I mean, you know, it would be an enforceable affidavit and um, they would only be able to get a disbursement in the amount equal to the uncontested amount. So the risk would be limited by those two factors. Uh, so that's, that's what I have. I think, um, you know, my feeling is that if we're going to postpone this, we ought to kind of reaffirm because we did have a pretty substantial discussion about the structure at the last meeting and it seemed to make sense to everybody. So um, rather than opening up the entire can of worms again, I would like to reaffirm kind of a commitment to that structure um, and see if we can work on the numbers a little bit. Okay, thank you, Councillor Trevorrow. Again, we're just talking about this one amendment at this moment, um, Councillor Dion. I could favor your amendment because it's driving the price down. I can't escape the fact that we have to pay for this in a budget. And, and I feel like we're on the track that we need perfect in order to be satisfied as opposed to good. I share Councilor Zaro's reluctance this evening. That's how I'm perceiving it to have a vote because I too have questions. I mean, I see this idea of prorating, that makes sense to me. That way you maximize the dollars against the backdrop of multiple candidates. They all don't get a perfect sum, but they get citizen support. Uh, the idea of an enforceable affidavit, I don't know. I don't know how you enforce that. You gotta get a judgment, then you gotta collect a judgment. I mean, it, it just seems we're stretching so hard to make it perfect. Like, if I can't explain this, this will probably take a 10 story elevator ride to explain it to a constituent, I'm not doing a good job. It's becoming incredibly complex. I've championed clean elections repeatedly in the state legislature and ran under that status only once because I needed staff assigned just to manage clean election reporting requirements, okay? If a mayoral candidate spent money in June in a bid to be mayor, some of my political experts would say, you spent your money too early. No one's paying attention, right? Nothing happens till after Labor Day in May. That's the problem with clean elections. There's so many myths, legends about what happens. I've seen people collect a lot, a lot of money and they're still citizens. They never, they never won. People can see through the money. I share Councilor Rodriguez's concerns about how much money we're gonna spend because I don't think money determines who gets elected. I agree with Councilor Ali. It's shoe leather, knocking at doors, having a message that resonates with people. They need citizen support. And as much as I admire my former colleague from the Senate, my seatmate, as a traditional candidate, if I was beholden to someone, they never knocked at my door because I thought it was regular people giving me regular money. And as one often said to me, if you're gonna ask me for five, I'll give you 50. If you're gonna ask me for 25, I'll give you a hundred. But there was no quid pro quo. You know, so I, 
I'm really reluctant to throw this much money on the supposition on the assertions made by mathematical table, and we call it historical data. And therefore we're supposed to rely on it like a talisman. It's the only way to go forward. I can't do that. So I, I wanna read the, do we correct the foreign country piece? I mean, is, we haven't? All right, I'm, I'm, I, this is a rhetorical question you can answer later, but I, I wanna make sure that 1%, if, if someone owns 1% of a corporation that was established in Delaware, I can't ask her for money, but then I could. I mean, are, are we so frightened of Canada? I guess that's the subtext. That somehow they'll influence a mayoral race in Portland. I don't know, I don't know. These, these things concern me. So I need to read all of this, right? And I'm sure Councilor Phillips, this is complicated. Counselor, I'm gonna use your term. It's complicated for me. I've got to read this through and mull it over and see if Delaware is excluded, you know? I know it sounds like a silly comment, but was that really the intent? 1%? That's a sub substantial and 1% don't equate. S substantial to me is 60 or 70% ownership in an entity. You know, why are we afraid of that? I don't know. So. I support your amendment, Madam Mayor, but I'm not sure I'm prepared to vote this evening uh, with clear conscience, a clear understanding of all the terms that are incorporated in this body of paperwork. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Next, I'll go to Councillor oh, Councillor Rodriguez and then Councillor Ali. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I So I think I agree with what I've heard that perhaps, um, most of us would appreciate more time to dive deeper into the actual amounts. However, I agree with Councillor Chavarro that today, um, perhaps we could reaffirm um, our our guidance on the actual structure of it, and even perhaps some of the um, questions that Councillor Sarah brought up. So with that in mind, um, given that we have your amendment on the floor right now, which is um, pretty much only addressing the numbers, um, should we consider um, either withdrawing it and postponing or so that way we can have the substantive discussion about the the model and not the amounts we, uh, we're we, trying to move us forward um tonight good question we can um i think we can how to procedurally what's the best way to do that michael to we've got we've got an amendment on the floor um do we want to kill it postpone it um usually we don't postpone an amendment that's why i'm asking Got a lot of lawyers in the room. <laughs> Danielle's looking at me like she's desperate to jump up. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's going to let me jump in. Thank you, Michael. Um, you, you're pacifying me. I, I think that if you want to talk structure, I would say withdraw the amendment and, and talk structure um, and then postpone that and come back to, to the amendment so that you can get into it. I'll happily withdraw, withdraw my amendment at this time. I second. Okay. Thank you. Um, however, so Councilor Rodriguez, you've got the floor and I do want to hand it over to Councilor Ali because he had his hand up earlier. Well, I am, um, because my comments were um, meant to give us guidance on that amendment, I will kind of pause now and see where the discussion goes. And then I do have some other thoughts about the um, model, but I don't okay. think we're quite there yet. Great. So we can get into that discussion, but Councilor Ali, do you want to, do you want to pause also because yours were specific to the amendment? Yeah, because you were driving your amendment uh, changes what I was going to say, but I'm going to throw it out there. Um, I am looking for the possibilities of uh, your amendment and uh, Councillor Trevorrow's uh, formula. Okay. Something like that, yeah. Great. Okay, everybody, we're good to move on. Okay, I think procedurally what we would, oh, uh, Corporation Council? We'll finish that and then I just have a question. Okay. So I think um, procedurally what we would normally do is look at the amendment that's in our packet next. Councillor Trevorrow, you've got an amendment. Um, do you want to make a motion so that we can talk about the content of that amendment? Um, sure. I, I guess I would move the amendment at this time. You, did you want to? Okay, because we have to decide whether, so are you thinking we wanted to go straight to the main motion without the amendment? Sorry about this, a little procedural input here. I guess all I was wondering is if you're if you want to talk structure, I would say dive into the details of the of the proposal in okay. front of you. I think okay. I think this Let's amendment's focused our... on um, funding, I believe, Councillor Trevorrow. It's more funding focused. It little... is. 
yes. Yeah. So I would say that I would hold those, hold those talk structure, get guidance there. We can move to postpone okay. everything after that if that's the way the council would like to go. That's okay with me. Is that I'm looking around the dais, Councilor Trevorrow, Does that sound okay to you? That we'll take up the main motion and then we can talk about amendments later. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The floor is open for discussion. Uh, oh yeah, we have a, we we do have a motion and a second on on the uh, the order in front of us, which is order one seventy one. So we do have so much paper from the various workshops and the memos and all of that. I want to acknowledge that, but what we're acting on tonight is this: twenty one pages of ordinance language. Spent a lot of time here this week. <laughs> yes. Yes. So our at the action before the council tonight is amendment to Portland's uh, city code chapter nine, clean elections. So every, the 21 pages we've got in front of us um, is what you all looked at at the April 3rd workshop and what constitutes the first read. First to Councilor Rodriguez, then to Councilor Zaro. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, so to this draft that we have, um, I will say that um, I am in favor of uh, what's presented of us, and I think it's represent it in the, is indicative of what we discussed in the workshop. And I just wanted to speak specifically of the what I think is one of the um, you know quote unquote points of contentions, which is the date of the first um, distribution. Um, I am personally uh, satisfied with um, what what we have currently in front of us, which includes the affidavit that the candidates would sign. And also um, the other, um, uh, I forgot the, the words that Councilor Trevorrow used to, to, to describe both of these things, um, I guess like risk um, management strategies. <laughs> the other one being that we only limit that distribution to the uncontested amount um, that we've indicated on, on the package. So um, again, just wanna say that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in favor of what's in front of us. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Um, <laughs> That's all I have. Okay. I didn't want to get into the amounts. No, no rush. Um, Councillor Zaro. Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, okay. So just to reiterate what I was saying before, you know, I agree with what uh, someone uh, said in public comment that we need this first election to be successful. Um, and I think if we're having trouble explaining, uh, you know, a little bit of the dates, the funding, uh, it it might not be successful in the same way that um, you know, it might be if it were underfunded, which is the other alternative. So I feel like maybe we are overcomplicating a little bit uh, uh, at the moment because there are a lot of variables in front of us. Um, I, I do have a couple of concerns about the amount and I've been pretty open about that. I, I think we do need to come down a tiny bit uh, on a couple of, of the positions, uh, especially as we're looking at the budget. But you know, again, we, we wanna be really intentional about it. So looking at um, what has been proposed uh, this evening you know, and the general reaction of our colleagues looking around at the sheer volume, um, you know, I, I don't know how we can reaffirm our commitment to something without taking an actual vote, but I, I do believe that we could move forward in good faith to postpone this to next week, get together, uh, iron out the final details. It sounds like there actually are a few more that folks have even brought up this evening that I hadn't thought about yet. Um, so uh, again, I just wanna reaffirm that. I, I, I really appreciate the leadership, you know, that you and Councilor Trevara have put into this so far. Um, Really, really do. Uh, thank you. Uh, but I, um, that's kind of where I'm at right now. We can get into it. We can start throwing numbers from the floor. I, for one, think that would be a really bad idea, considering what this journey, the journey that this just went through to get on our desks this evening. So um, what's, what's one more week in the grand scheme? Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump in. Thank you, Councilor Zaro. So I... Um... <laughs> spent a long time getting familiar with this document this weekend. I'm not gonna talk about numbers at all. So my intention here is just to dive into the ordinance, the city ordinance that would be before us for action tonight. Um, and I have a few questions about it. Um, the, we, we learned that the intention regarding the affidavit, um, which would be employed if the funds were distributed, so municipal funds distributed to a, a, a potential or an intended candidate. Um, uh, so you haven't yet qualified for the ballot. 
um, but you're going to get a distribution of funds. The intention, again, is that there would be an affidavit signed. So if for some reason or another you drop out of the race or you don't get the required number of signatures to land on the ballot, that you would need to pay that back. Is there language in this ordinance draft that is um, specific to that so that everybody could be a, you know, very clear that that provision is only a one-year provision and that the intention is that there would be a charter amendment sent to voters to move the deadlines so that distributions could happen earlier than that, um, that the, the dates right now, which the first uh, date to turn in papers to qualify for the ballot would be August 14th. So that's, that's I'm starting, I have, I have a few questions. That's, that's one of them. Does the ordinance language make clear that this affidavit provision is just a one year fix? I think the short answer is, is no. Um, we did not attempt to in, imply any sort of charter revision or amendment in this ordinance. So the way that it's written, um, and I think it's page 301 of your packet, if you're looking at the packet page numbers, um, the timing of the initial disbursement, bottom uh, part C, in the event that the initial disbursement is prior to the candidates being able to qualify for the ballot, the amount of the initial distribution shall be the amount specified for uncontested races in subsection A. To receive this initial distribution, a certified candidate must sign the affidavit required above if the certified candidate has not qualified for the ballot and has no opponent. The remaining balance owed to the certified candidate for the initial distribution shall be distributed by the city clerk as soon as practicable once both the certified candidate and an opponent qualify for the ballot. So this was intending to be a, you know, to Councillor Dion's point, not trying to get it perfect, but this is supposed to live on its own in case this council does not take action on changing the dates. Just a question, what page are you reading from? Uh, from the packet, it's 301 to 302, it's section. Could you refer to the page number of the packet that you handed out? Maybe since everybody's looking at your okay. Oh great! Oh, I'm looking at it. It is one. okay. I found it now. Thank you. Oh great! Okay. Is there an extra one of? Uh, do I have that? There's 301. Okay. 301 down the bottom. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. That that's helpful. So it would be incumbent on this council probably then to amend the ordinance after year one to reflect that. And it would also be incumbent on the council to make sure that there's a um, charter amendment that goes to voters in November that would affect the following year's election. Yeah, yes. And I, I guess the other caveat would be if this council decides to postpone, we could try to have amended language for to an, anticipate that for, for next Monday, trying not to open up the the can of worms too much for us to have a bunch of amendments over the next week, but we could try to, that's something that this council picked up on. We could try to work on okay. as one of you sponsored amendments. Yeah, a couple more questions if you wanna hang by the mic. Um, so section, cause I think if we were to postpone until next week, we, I, I would, I'd love to use tonight to have as much discussion as we might need to because a week is not that far away and whatever would we would be at, unless there are changes to tonight's first read, we'd have the same first read in the packet on Wednesday, or yeah, on Wednesday, so I wanna be thoughtful about that. So on page 292 at the bottom, there's section 9-63. And um, I wanted to be clear here. So my understanding in the current structure is that you do not have to be qualified as a candidate in order to receive municipal funding. Um, this provision of the ordinance amendment in front of us says that eligibility for participating candidates to qualify as a certified candidate eligible to receive and retain payments from the fund, a candidate must, and then number one, meet the requirements to be listed on the ballot as a candidate for mayor, city council, or the school board pursuant to the provisions of Article 4 of the city charter. And Article 4 of the city charter talks about um, how we get on the ballot. And so it seems to me here that I, I could be mistaken, but I wanna be just explicit. It looks like you have to qualify for the ballot in order to get the distributed clean election funds. And I, have a, I would, I would wanna be really careful about that before we move on it.
And if it's not something that you can answer now, I'll flag it as a question. Uh, I, I know this was yeah. talked about at the workshop, so I don't, I don't. Mayor. While he's care of it, uh, Mayor. Um, while he's researching that, mm -hmm. may I ask a quick question of Corporation Council? Sure. In regards to these affidavits and the uh, monies that should be returned to the city, if the candidate just refuses to do so, can you give us a, just a primer of the practical mechanical process you'd have to engage in to at least attempt a recovery or should we just write it off from the beginning? Uh, well, <laughs> um, it, I, I mean, you, yes. It, it, it certainly may be difficult to collect those funds after they've been spent. Um, it's all going to depend, and and you know you can go through the process of asking for it nicely, asking for it less nicely. Um, you know, filing a, a complaint, you know, and a collections action, taking steps like that. Um, it's a it's a lot of work, and you may end up getting nothing in return. Thank you. I just wanted to bring that up, Madam Mayor, because we use words that make us feel really good that we've done something when I'm just trying to highlight the fact that these affidavits make great language, but as a practical matter, mean little or nothing. So we at least accept the fact that if we give money to a candidate who fails to become an actual candidate, kind of like a conditional certificate of occupancy before you actually qualify to have one, and they disappear, then our money has disappeared. That's, I'd rather be frank about that than hide behind the idea that there's this legal affidavit that will return money to the treasury that belong to the people to begin with. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for that little segue. I'm going to take the floor back because I've got a few more questions and I think we have an answer. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the, the time. Um, so uh, this may, be, may not be as um, eloquent as it should be, but the idea here in section 9-663 is in order for a certified candidate to be able to receive and retain the payments. So that word in that opening paragraph in able to retain the payments of not A is that you do have to qualify for the ballot. So our intent there was to clarify receive and retain as a certified candidate. And then further down where it talks about having to return if you do okay. not qualify for the ballot. Um, so, okay. as, as I think we discussed the the work, one of the workshops, there are a lot of levers here, and when you pull one, it sort of <laughs> pulls another. Um, so that was our attempt to show that in order to retain the payments that are distributed from the fund, you have to qualify for the ballot. Got it. Okay. Thank you. That helps and satisfies the question. Um, another quick question for you, I think quick, is... Um, uh, page 295, uh, this has to do with funding that a candidate may have in, re may, like, let's say you've run for city council before, you have money that's in a bank account. Um, so my question here is, uh, in, in section five, if a candidate has accepted contributions that are not seed money contributions as defined herein, or do not comply with these seed money contributions, restrictions, the candidate is ineligible to be a certified candidate in the same election cycle. So how does that, I, I guess I want to be thoughtful and careful about how that applies to somebody who might have a bank account with previous money raised. So that um, is actually a different section that yeah, I'm probably not going to put on, put my finger on. Um, those are two independent issues. Okay. So Funding from a previous campaign in a bank account needs to be um, disposed of prior to, and there's a limitation that you can take, you can contribute uh, your own amount of seed money to your own campaign. So the $100 you can take out of your account, put it over to your seed money account. The rest has to be disposed of similarly to um, what the state allows. Um, on page 293, um, part B5, uh, if that if that if the candidate has any campaign, nope, that's not the right book, four, uh, that the candidate has disposed of campaign surplus funds in accordance with the requirements of 21A, including donating such surplus to the fund 
and it carries on. One of the uh, allowances under uh, state statute is to do a restricted or unrestricted donation to the municipality. So we sort of just made it explicit that you can donate to the Clean Elections Fund if you if you wish. The section that you were referencing, uh, Mayor, is basically if you happen to go out, you're not familiar with the system you collect, it's limited to $500, but if you collect $500 instead of that $100 a bunch of times and you turn in your seed money report, sorry, but you violated the, the restrictions on seed money and you'd have to go traditional. Okay. That would be and hence that section that you pointed out. Okay. Thank you, because I, I thank you. I had seen the declaration of intent language, but then when I read further, I was like, I was a little confused by it. Um, okay, the last question I have for the moment is um, actually in Article Six, the campaign finance section, which is at the very end of the packet for um, everybody. I I'm looking at my my own printed version here, so I'm going to tell you which page I'm on. At least I'm going to try to. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Um, so, right, so campaign finance um, section six. I do, I, I don't, I don't want to forget about this. Um, we, at the very end, section 995, we talk about campaign contributions reporting. And so, you know, part of my, my thinking going into tonight is what are we, what are we spending? What are we, what are we putting in the budget as we move from tonight's receipt of the city manager's budget? What do we need to do in the count in the finance committee um, over the next few weeks? And so i I'm focusing on the, the reporting and right now we have $30,000 that we've been told is enough. And I have, I have a concern there that I wanted to ask the clerk to speak to because I'm not sure 30,000 is gonna get us there. And I think it will be um, something that we, we're, we're obligated to do within the ordinance, right? So looking at the ordinance language, can Ashley, can you just weigh in, in a little bit on where we are with regard to knowing how much it's gonna cost and what, um, what our next steps look like? So one of the things that uh, my office did was we had to put out an RFP for a clean elections database because even at the 30,000, which has been talked about over the last couple of years of what the estimate was for this uh, one time cost of providing a uh, searchable online database for campaign finance, um, it's over the $25,000. So we did an RFP for it. It was out there for a month. We received two responses. We, that just closed two days ago. We haven't scored them. Um, but the upfront cost for one of them is $454,000 with an annual fee of $65,000. And the second one is $504,000 with an annual fee of $78,000. So just keep that in mind as we're putting funds into this budget that an online searchable database is not going to be a one-time fee. Um, it is extremely expensive. Um, and again, it was out there for a month only two responses. We have not scored them, so there's not much other detail I can give you other than the two preliminary numbers of what that award base is for upfront costs to put something like this together. Um, right now, we upload our campaign finance reports. The PDFs go on our website. Um, it's arguably not searchable, so um, that's why this was put in there, um, and we did the RFP process, and that's where we are right now. Do you see a way to work around that so that we can be more in line with the projected uh, even if we were to work with these two individuals, there's no way I don't think we would even be able to get the cost halfway down um, uh, to do this. Um, I did talk with the state um, and their stuff that they've been working on um, is thousands of dollars as well um, for some updates that they're doing um, to their different stuff. So it's, it's, it's costly. I, and I just wanted to weigh in just for a minute on that piece of it, because as I mentioned during the, the budget uh, discussion earlier, um, I just, I know you all probably heard me. I just want to remind you, I only budgeted 290,000 for this. So I'm getting, you know, as I'm writing my list here, I'm getting a little concerned about collections actions because I know how costly they are. I'm actually wondering, I know um, uh, Ashley didn't include any specific additional staff in, to address this, but this program, the, as, the more, as the more we get into it and the more complicated it gets, I worry, I worry about whether or not she's gonna need a staff person or at least a part-time person to help her with this. Um, we have that, you know, four to 500,000 plus 60 to 70 each year thereafter for the database 
And then the proposal in front of you potentially doubles that 260,000 that I included in there. So we're looking at like more than a million dollars. That's almost tripled the cost. And so I just want, I just, that that's why this cost has been jumping off the page to me and really making me very nervous when I'm looking at the budget in a bigger context. I know we're not specifically talking about the budget piece of this right now, but it's just something to really think about, um, especially as we move forward, because um, it's, it's a significant expense. And yet work we have to do. So um, I actually have Councillor Trevorrow's hand up and then I'll go to you, Councillor Ali. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm trying to remember the things that were in my mind. Um, I wanted to also point out that the number of clean election checks compared to the number of signatures, the, I mean, the effort to get clean election checks and qualify for clean elections is so much more difficult than getting signatures to qualify for the ballot. And I think that while we are taking some risk in this proposal, when you look at it globally, it's a very small risk to be able to offer something that makes this program much more competitive. And, you know, Councillor Dion, I think, said that it doesn't have to be perfect. Well, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it should be workable. It should be something that's attractive to candidates, and it should be something that we can build on with knowledge of how to go forward next year. If we create a program that's not viable, it's not going to give us any information on how we need to improve upon it for future years. Um, so, you know, it's not, this is, this is living up to the obligation that the voters mandated. And so I think we have a responsibility to put forward our best effort and make every effort to make it attractive and usable to candidates. Um, so, with that, oh, the other thing is for this year, we're not using um, an online program. So that's not part of the kind of upfront first cost in the first year of this anyway. Um, but I think, again, we have an obligation to fund this properly. Um, whatever we decide is allocated to candidates, we have to be willing to make good on that. So. Um, you know, I think we need to take a, a look at this in the finance committee and see, you know, how much does this increase actually impact the overall guidance that the council has given on the budget? Um, because I think it might fit, still fit within that. Um, I think that that was everything I, oh, um, yeah, and then as far as the online program, I know um, that the clerk actually was working with the state and um, I know that there is an expense to that as well. So I, I know it's it's no expense, but perhaps um, working with them may be a better option than outsourcing it. I'm not 100% sure on what those costs are exactly. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Trevorrow. Councillor Ali? Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. I came in here tonight hoping that um, we might be able to just vote on this and uh, uh, make sure that it happens. Um, but as things are unfolding, it seems like uh, it's going to be uh, complicated. Oh, it is not going to be complicated. It is more complicated than I thought when I was leaving home around 3.45. Um, my question is, I, and I want us to be honest to ourselves, are we sure that we will be ready to vote on this by Monday. That is one. The second question is uh, Corporation Council or uh, City Clerk. If for whatever reason, I make a suggestion that uh, in order to get it to whether it is perfect or close to perfect, we postpone this to the 15th. Uh, will that be a problem on your timeline of putting it on the ballot? Oh no, on making sure that uh, it works for June or whenever we come up with. So it it uh, it doesn't need to go on the ballot. But the further we push this down the road, the the less time my office has to to get this program put together. So the forms are ready. There's uh, education out there on how this is going to work um, with potential you know future candidates um, and spreading that out there because 
the further we go, the less time that is, and then there's not going to be as much time to to educate everyone on how the program is going to work. Councilor wow. Philippe, what did I say the other time? Is it catch 22 or catch 55? And then you told me that that was not the way. And I said, that is the Ghanaian in me flipping it upside down. Um, yes, I said that before to her. Um, because I, I rather uh, be, vote on something that uh, prospect uh, candidates would look at it and say, hey, um, this is clearly uh, understandable. Then uh, based on what I'm seeing now, I don't know if we'll be ready to vote on this on Monday, but that is me. If my colleagues believe that by Monday they will be ready for us to move it forward, I will go along. Thank you, Councillor. I um, first of all, this seems like a perfect time to point out that we've got Paul Riley with us from elections. Thanks for being here, Paul. This is all going to fall to you. Um, <laughs> Thanks for being here. That's really great. I actually, on the point of simplicity that Councillor Ali was just talking about, one of the things that I was thinking about over the weekend was, um, and I think Councillor Trevorrow touched on this too, the, in my view, we, we want this to help candidates. We don't want it to be something that is an extra burden. Um, and, and so in, as I was trying to think about it, I was thinking about, can we coincide um, the collection of signatures with the collection of qualifying contributions? So instead of having a bunch of different deadlines, in some ways, it's nice to think about, you've got an August 14th deadline for your signatures. Could that be your deadline for your qualifying contributions? And that unlocks the, um, the fund. I think the way that we see it in the current ordinance, there are multiple, um, deadlines associated with signatures, or sorry, with qualifying contributions, and then you've got that other deadline associated with signatures. So as, as we think about moving forward and how we explain things to potential candidates and simplify it for them, I, I, did, I was thinking about that. How do we, um, how do we maybe um, align the, the deadlines so that the work can all be seen as um, integrated. If you're if you have a declaration of intent and you want to be a clean elections candidate, collecting signatures, collect your qualifying contributions, and then be qualified. Um, but that that might take a little bit of, of work to think about that language. Councillor Diane, did you have a hand up? Oh, one just a question to the lawyers and then a comment that probably circles back to them and Corporation Council. It would be really nice if we clarify the foreign thing. I hate to harp on this, but if my brother, who's a significant equity partner in an LLC in Boston, it appears he can't contribute to my seed money, right? That doesn't seem right. It, it precludes the fact I may have colleagues and friends outside the state of Maine who might want to assist in a mm -hmm. candidacy. And I'll use myself as an example because I don't want to put it on the spot with anyone else. Um, in terms of my colleague, uh, Councilor Trevorrow's commentary that, regarding my need for good rather than perfect, I, I think there's a term that she employs, we all employ, and I have difficulty with, is what constitutes a viable campaign. There, there's an underlying text to clean election that it's got to be funded in a certain way that you're viable and people who want to participate. I don't know what a viable campaign looks like because every campaign is unique to the candidate and their assumed constituency. So again, having all the money doesn't guarantee success. So my question for council is, what does the charter expect? Does it define what substantial funding looks like? Does it give us parameters? And that would be very important to consider on the finance committee because if it's a term without meeting, then every number satisfies. And, and that could prove to be a real debate here because we get back to the subjective is, I think a mayor all race should have $200,000. I could run a pretty good campaign for 200,000. On the other hand, if I hear my colleague, Councilor Rodriguez, I think we could get, to get it done in 50,000 too. Either they like what you have to say or they don't. So throwing more money at them doesn't guarantee anything else. But this legal question of what constitutes substantial funding in satisfaction of the charter language is something I would like to know. Thank you. If, if 
I thank you, con Councillor. Is that a question? Oh. I, I think that was directed toward, toward legal counsel. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if that's the case, then I'll try answering it. <laughs> well, only because I was, I was there with regard to the charter. Perhaps I'm maybe in a better position to try to answer at least the first question. And no, someone down in Delaware is not foreign. I did raise with the Charter Commission that that's something that we could say under Maine law, but there's a definition. What they meant was foreign as far as in another nation. And so we have proposed a definition in here that uh, the foreign investor means uh, someone who owns or controls part of a business entity, but is a government of a foreign country or is a foreign national from another country. And so that's that's the definition that we've adopted for this ordinance. I, I did see that under foreign investor. That's fine. So but I was concerned about the other previous language as well. Right. With regard, with regard to the full funding, that yeah. was uh, that was what was proposed uh, by members of the Charter Commission. And there wasn't much explanation as to what was intended by full funding. They simply said they wanted to see full funding. Uh, a fiscal note was not required as part of the charter process but one was voluntarily suggested by a charter commission member, and that was the $260,000 amount that uh, you'll see cited in the report. Jim, Jim, what was the actual word that was used in the charter? Was it full? It, it was. Uh, let me take a look. This is with regard to question three. The city council shall establish and fully fund a city of Portland clean election fund, provide campaign funds to qualified candidates for elected municipal offices. That was the language. And, and that's what will be added to the charter, that exact language you just read? Okay. Jim, can you repeat that language one more time? The city council shall establish and fully fund a city of Portland clean election fund. Now, one, one quick thing, uh, discussion was, was had for just a moment with regard to the, uh, the database. There is a timeline with regard to the clean election ordinance that had to be in place for fiscal year 2023, 2024. That's with regard to the clean elections fund. That same language doesn't appear with campaign finance. So it does not. It does not. Okay. So we wouldn't have to do that um, that campaign finance piece with the database until a future year. It just says that you must do it. It does not have a time requirement. Oh, so it's up to us, I guess, to, if we if we budget for it in FY twenty four or some future year. Councillor Trevorrow, I see you have a hand up. Yeah, so I've learned a little bit about this. Um, in terms of interpretations of that language and, and you know, it is new, so there's some ambiguity, but my understanding of um, kind of likely interpretation of fully fund is that we as a council have kind of more discretion over the, what we determine to be maximum distributions to candidates than we do over fully funding that. So once we decide, you know, each candidate is going to get X amount, then we are we are potentially obligated to fund the fund to provide for that. Um, and that's kind of part of why I I want added that piece to my amendment where the council can replenish the fund because it kind of in my mind gives us an opportunity to live up to that fully funding um, obligation in the charter. Um, the other thing I would say I know that there was language I think in the charter commission report about how much this program would cost annually um, but I believe that that was kind of an annual average estimate, um, not necessarily considering the differences in mayoral years. Um, and, you know, my, just my sense is that this, the first year of the program, because it's new and because it's a mayoral year, it's gonna cost more upfront um, than, than it will in the off years. And I think, um, I think actually the clean elections group may, 
have some projection data on um, how after you know you make that kind of upfront funding, then year over year there is some carryover funding. Um, and I think um, Anna Keller testified to this earlier that would allow us to have funding available even in the mayoral years, you know, going out. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're far off from this at this point, but my intention when and if I ever offer this amendment would actually be to amend the amendment so that our, the only year that we budget 500,000 would be in the first year and then thereafter it would be 250. Um, I think that that is everything I had to say right now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I have I actually have a quick question. Jim, do you want to address? This, this is just a little bit more gloss on the fully fund piece because that, that first paragraph is what I read to you. Below it, beginning in fiscal year 2023-2024 to allow for implementation of the November 2023 election, the city council shall provide an independent allocation from the city's budget each year to ensure the clean election fund is sustained at a level that facilitates competitive campaigns for participating candidates who meet qualifying criteria. The clean election fund shall be administered by the city clerk and the city council shall appropriate sufficient funds to ensure uh, there are adequate resources, including paid staff to effectively administer the fund. But that first sentence perhaps or that second paragraph may provide some guidance for you. Uh, the city council shall provide an independent allocation from the city's budget each year to ensure the clean election fund is sustained at a level that facilitates competitive campaigns for, for participating candidates who meet qualifying criteria. Thank you. I'm going to just jump in here. I think my understanding of that, um, uh, as I read through Councillor Trevorrow's uh, proposed amendment tonight, is this is a this is an annual budget decision, and I think that's what you're saying is that um, every year the council is going to need to approve a budget that contains funding for clean elections. So even if you write it into an ordinance, um, that, that's, I guess that the work is gonna have to be done and the context is gonna have, so I, I would think it would be worth thinking about whether we write that into the ordinance or we just know that it's all, you're always gonna have to make a budget allocation. Um, can, go ahead. Related to that issue, do you mind if I ask Jim a question? No, go ahead. A clarifying question, Jim. And if you can, earlier at the beginning of the um, presentation, you discussed briefly the, um, the the binding future boards concept. Can you talk about that concept with respect to the the numbers that we're talking about right now that may be included in the right. in the ordinance? What if you were to say that the council shall you know, in, in mayoral years, mayoral election years, it's $500,000, it's 250,000 in other years. Uh, you can say that, you can put that in your ordinance, but it doesn't bind a future city council from saying more or less. And, and maybe what you might do is just fall back on the language that's actually here in the charter and use that as your guidepost in each year, appropriate that sum that you believe is necessary. And maybe just, uh, we had borrowed from Santa Fe and put an $800,000 cap. And basically, if you got to 800,000, there should be sufficient money that maybe you don't need to appropriate that year uh, when you get this turning over from year to year. But maybe the way to go is not to put a specific number in, but just to rely on the charter language uh, to make sure that it's sufficient to, uh, to facilitate competitive campaigns. And then each year, it's the council's decision. Jim, can Thank I you. ask a follow up? Are you saying then you would want just that to be part of the budget allocation is what you're suggesting in terms of numbers for candidates and all of those specifics? What we'd, well, what we'd say is the money that would allow you to make those distributions, the source would be this funding as well as any donations and any money that's thrown in from uh, carried over. But as far as a source, it would be up to the council to appropriate that amount of money and use this as a, as a guidepost. Um, I, Jim, I think I have a, just a quick follow up there, and then I know of Councillor Dion and Councillor Fournier. So I'm looking at the um, the it's it's in our first read packet. It's this three page document that has the um, kind of the various elements of seed money and other distribution spelled out. But the the last page is kind of what I tried to mimic here. It's this page. Um, so again, this is in our first read, and it it contemplates five hundred thousand from the current budget or the upcoming budget, 
20,000 and change of qualifying contributions. Um, and, but the need for the total distribution under the clean elections program, it would be $578,000. And so what we see is that this funding model has been prorated at 0.9%. And so what this is telling me is that we wanted to give the mayor candidate 120,000, but we were only able to fund at 108,000. And so in the ordinance language that we're looking at tonight, I think what happens here, and, and that my question is, I just wanna be clear that I'm correct here, is that for the 12,000 or so that each mayor candidate didn't get from the clean elections fund because it needed to be prorated, that's the funding that they could then go out and do private fundraising for so that they meet that funded amount. Am I right on that? No, okay. Not, not well, um, <laughs> I see nodding heads yes and, and shaking heads no. So I'm. So not, not quite. So under the first read proposal, we got rid of the proration, if you remember. It is a first come, first serve. What this chart shows oh. is if you had kept prorations. It, so, and it, it is confusing, and I apologize, but we tried to keep the charts consistent so you could compare different proposals. So the proration column was still there to show, even if you did the 500,000, you were gonna be short in some way. Now under the, the first read proposal, it's first come first serve. So those that got in their qualifying contributions, both initial and supplemental, would be the first ones to get funding. Somebody that came in later, and if the fund is depleted, that first come first serve situation would be, they'd still have to submit their qualifying contributions, but then could go out and hit the pavement to collect under sort of traditional rules. So, so some clean elections candidates might get fully funded and some clean elections candidates would do private fundraising. Under the original proposal without Councillor Trevorrow's amendment, that's, that's part of the packet tonight. Okay, so the amendment, the amendment Tries gets- to address that by Oh, by having a city council allocation. But in the event, so it says the city council may, by resolution, appropriate additional amounts. If the council chose not to, because it's the word may, exactly. that would trigger the private fundraising. Right. And because, okay, so so you said um, the proration that's that's shown in this chart is not right. So we're no longer prorating. There is no proration under okay. the first reading. So it's, it's there to show in, as an example, had, had I it, see. you kept the proration, what it would, what it would have been. It basically would have reduced funding back. And the reason I was nodding my head was just, if you didn't do the proration as in tonight's draft, then yes, you, you would be able to raise the extra money through private funding up to the limits of how much you think. Okay, so I guess I, I'll, my comment there is that I feel like e clean elections should put people on equal footing. And if people, if it's first come first serve and some people if you're still qualifying within appropriate deadlines, but some people get their money first and other people have to fundraise to get that level, that could be tricky. And then the other piece that would be concerning would be um, the amount of time it could take for that additional allocation to be made. And if I may, um, the one of the issues we ran into trying to piece this all together is we could not come up with a simple solution to allowing multiple rounds of distributions with proration because you don't know how much to prorate without sort of having those, everybody comes in on the same day, you certify and you figure out what's there and then put out the checks. With this rolling, continuing submitting supplemental, uh, unless you've put all the supplementals on specific dates so you knew how much was in the fund at certain dates at time and release it all at once, the proration just didn't work with this, the, the multiple rounds, mm -hmm. as opposed to in, in an, an original, one of our alternate proposals where we did two rounds, we made made it sure that it was two specific dates that had the, the papers turned in and released. And, it, and the earlier date was a very limited amount that was released to make sure we didn't sort of get into a proration, although hypothetically you could have if everybody submitted on that first date. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's what I saw when I went back in our materials from the first workshop was there was that, um, well, we had those different models that uh, you built yeah. responding yeah. to the first workshop. 
Got it. Okay. I have three hands up. Councillor Dion, Councillor Fournier, and Councillor Trevaro. I'm going to yield to Councillor Fournier. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm just trying to clarify. There's a lot of information. <laughs> so I'm just trying to bring this back. So going back to kind of that last tail that we were on. So if we are depleted and um, now the people that came forward for clean elections now have to do private fundraising. Is it to the clean elections limits or are they now a traditional candidate? So they're no longer clean elections, they're traditional. They would, assume, they would still have to qualify. So you would still have to get your su supplemental uh, qualifying contribution. So you're 100 and under the, well, I think it's 150 100, for yeah. mayor to then that money would go back to those funds. So you get, you'd pretty much get it back. And then that difference, you would then be still considered a clean elections candidate, but you would be able to fundraise to the max as a traditional candidate. So that $500 contribution max Oh, is, is how we tried to draft it. Okay. Um, so you would, you would, it somewhat defeats that purpose if, if to, to get the, the big money out, but right. um, trying to make it as simple as possible. If you did have to go and become that traditional candidate to do it as efficiently as possible. Okay. Um, and then going back to the the not binding from year over year. So in my mind, it's like at the beginning of the year, it comes in front of the council to say, um, just like you're setting, you know, parking rates or whatever. So this year's clean elections allocations are proposed to be this council votes on it. And that's what it is for that year. Is that kind of what we're thinking? I think that sort of has to be the, 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 the crapshoot here is the charts in front of you are the averages over the last 10 years. <laughs> if, if you have one less mayoral or one more mayoral or any others, it could swing things very differently. So every year, you'll have to take a sort of guess at how many candidates do you think will be running and running clean to set the adequate amount. Um, and the contested and uncontested amounts, I guess, could be set somewhat more in stone to say, okay, if you're a mayoral candidate, you're gonna get the 75,000, but your guess on how much put in the budget would be based on the number of candidates you have. Sure, okay. Um, and then my last question, just about the chart, so I'm understanding it. So if we had three mayoral candidates, three at large, two for each of the districts, two for the school board at large, and then two for each of the school board districts, and they all maxed out what they were able to get, the program would need to be funded at $367,000 and everybody would get their money. Uh, so you're looking at the, this is mayor, the, the mayor's um, chart. I know, so many pieces of paper, thank you. Um, so based on, on that proposal, um, between, and, and the difference here, she also does not uh, have the seed money offset. So the, okay. the total amount that would needed would be the 367 total, but then you back out the qualifying fund. The 16,000, okay. Which is why when I first started talking about that, Got it. those qualifying contributions needed do not necessarily match the first three numbers. I didn't gotcha. touch, okay. touch those. So that $16,000 number would swing one way or the other, depending on what you determined was the required or right number of um, qualifying contributions. And we, in the, the first read packet, I worked with Council Trevard to try to match the, I don't want to use proration, but the number of qualifying contributions for the amount of money you were getting. So it sort of tracked amongst the different ballots. So it, you may decide it, if it's less money, there should be fewer qualifying contributions needed to to get those triggers, but those haven't been touched in this in the okay. amendment. Great, that's helpful, thank you. Um, thank I think you. my my last comments, and I know, and I appreciate all my colleagues, this is a ton to go through and try and wrap your brain around. Um, I, you know, am excited to run as a clean elections candidate. You know, I think it's a great program and I'm glad that we're spending time to get this um, right. So I think I'm kind of in the middle of both of these structurally, I like what's, what you put forward. I think that makes a lot of sense to me and I think I'm good with that. Um, I think with the mayor's amendment, I'm more in the middle with amounts 
Um, and so I, I don't think we're there yet on numbers, but I, I'm getting closer. Um, but I really appreciate the questions because there's some that I just haven't considered as we've had this conversation because it is a ton um, to go through. And I you know, have uh, supported clean elections for a while. So I thought I had a pretty good understanding. I had no idea. <laughs> So this is really beneficial, um, but I think that's all my questions for now. Thank you. Great. And next we'll go to Councillor Trevorrow on Zoom. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to speak a little bit to the rationale behind the um, the first come first serve versus um, proration. The the first come first serve is modeled after the state program. That's the language that they use. And um, my concern with the proration was that uh, basically, I think it's it's tied to the previous iteration of the timeline. So you wait until everybody gets qualified at the last minute so you know what your pool of candidates is. And then you kind of divvy out the fund on a prorated basis. And to me, that um, my concern with that is that it um, it kind of allows us to um, preemptively underfund the program um, and and not deliver on our promise to candidates. So, um, but again, the the amendment that I have to give the council the option to replenish the fund, um, it the the idea that they would go out to raise private funds. Um, first, they would only be allowed to raise up to what they would have qualified for clean elections. And uh, second, it would be like a very, very, very last resort. Um, you know, the fund would have to be depleted. The council would have to uh, consciously decide not to, to replenish the fund. And only then would they be allowed to fundraise up to what they would have qualified for clean elections. Um, I don't know, I can't see the full room to know how many hands are up, but I think at this point, I would be willing to just make a motion to postpone this to our next meeting. We, we do have an additional hand up from Councilor Ali, so I'm not sure if this is the exact right time, but I leave it to the council to, if, if, if somebody seconds, we'll take it up. Otherwise we'll continue discussion and Councilor Ali, I'll look to you. Yeah, I, I, will, I will ask my question and then I will second it. <laughs> but, <laughs> so it's kind of like a sandwich. Uh, yeah. Councillor Trevorrow made a motion and and hold hold tight. Okay. Yeah. What I was gonna say that as we are looking at how uh to decide how much it is going to cost for uh every year, I don't know if the timeline on uh when people will take out papers will align with our budget timeline. So uh, is it going to be supplemental or the council will have to meet again? Uh, because our budget timeline ends by June. The school will bring the years and then we'll vote on it and it will go to the uh, uh, public somewhere in June. I think by the time we vote on the, uh, the, uh, the school, the Board of Education's budget, uh, we somewhere knowing what percentage of uh, um, the tax increase is going to go in and we're wrapping up because nobody votes on the city side, right? Um, are we going to just buy a loan X amount? Because we don't know how many people. Right now, uh, we're having this conversation. We don't know if uh, there's gonna be one mayoral candidate or 10, and we are in almost in May, right? So as we are moving this conversation forward, let's also look at that. I'm just sitting here thinking, and then I said, let me just throw this out there and then figure out how we can factor that into the conversation. Councilor Ali, thank you for that. I'm going to have the city manager ask um, or answer your question, but quick before you make your second, can I just ask one more quick question? Okay. Okay. <laughs> You're going to try to make me remember both. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead and answer okay. the question about the funding. Okay. I was going to say um, for you, Councilor Ali, that the, that's one of my concerns is obviously this wouldn't be in place. Um, I think we have to get it in place, but the fund itself wouldn't be in place till the next fiscal year. So having anything in place for June is going to be problematic. Um, uh, Brendan, our finance director, I would need to discuss with him, you know, what funds we could uh, appropriate specifically if there was anything prior to that fiscal year, if that was the council's choosing. But right now, um, the way that this would be set up would be funding for starting July 1. 
And I do think that having this in place, uh, you know, as long as we're done by the end of May is okay. We won't be taking up the city budget uh, for final action till June 5th. And so that still, I think, works within that timeline. But I am concerned about um, any funds being expended before July 1 because we don't have any specific funds set aside for this purpose at all. Um, thank you for letting me ask um, actually two quick questions. Just in the in the ordinance amendment, we, we understand the contested races and how the money would be distributed. Um, I'm, I'm just blanking on whether or not there are specific dates in the ordinance that would trigger those distributions um, specific to this question. Yes, so... Um, sorry, I, get I should know that because I'm, but I'm... Where you're going to want to look, Mayor, is the the seed money period, the qualifying period, um, and as part of the packet, there's there's a, a sort of chart, and I think you've referenced it in the past. This guy, um, the Councilor Shavar, yeah, Councilor yeah. Shavar's proposal is sort of what I did to distinguish it from our other proposals. There's a key dates. Um, okay. That's right. So in the in the ordinance itself, it'll talk about, and I can point you to it, initial distribution, supplemental distributions, and those those dates. Um, but the key dates, uh, just for simplicity's sakes, are are laid out here. And to clarify um, what the city manager just spoke about, it's not contemplated to have any funds distributed until July 17th to a, account for the budget. You would be able to start collecting your qualifying contributions in the Arguably, the, the Treasury Department would have to create the fund for those checks to be deposited to, but there wouldn't be anything expended, presumably, until July 17th. So since the only action before the council is the ordinance, how do we approve dates for distribution? Oh, that's what I was asking. Can you point me to the place in the ordinance where the dates live? Yeah, it's in various places. Oh, okay. Um, All right. As long as I, I trust you, as long as it's there, I just didn't so see it. If you, um, so there's in the definitions itself, it talks about uh, the qualifying period uh, and the uh, seed money period, both subpart N and Q. And then in the actual uh, body of its, of um, the ordinance itself on page. Okay. Uh, Uh, starting on page 300, where it talks about distribution of funds to certified candidates, um, it talks about the amounts for contested and uncontested, and then the timing part, subpart C, on page bottom of page 301. Okay. The timing, and we've, um, I think, in Councilor Trevar's original um, draft, she had she had put specific dates. We had tied that back to sort of match charter language, where it's so many days before the election um, to hopefully address sort of future years so you're not tied to, and we think it all worked out for not falling on weekends. Okay. Can I ask one, well, go ahead. Well, so the 113 days, um, the, the initial. And that was one section that uh, we tried to correct with uh, the amendment for to not be so rigid for the city clerk's office. So that's in, Council Trevor's amendment is a little bit more okay. flexible, but okay. those were the dates, the specific dates we had. Okay, I'll let that be. And and so I guess my very, or I'll let that be just because it's here and I'll I'll read it more closely. But the, um, my, my quick question that I wanted to ask before Councilor Ali's second um, had to do with the clerk's office and the capacity for, for the distribution um, structure that's contemplated in this ordinance. So one thing, uh, to point out is that right now, as it was written before the amendment, is that it's, you know, it shall be distributed, what does it say, uh, no later than 113 days. So that's saying on July 17th is the, it has to be distributed. That means that we would need to put something in place where a individual needs to give us all of those qualifying contributions so we can certify them and verify them, then submit it to the accounting office to cut a check. 
So just because it says that it, well, it says it has to be distributed within 113 days right now, but um, we would need time before that to make that happen. So the deadline would be different. The deadline would need to be sooner than that to submit your stuff for that initial disbursement. That's why we really tried um, to work through this at the beginning. And I, I know it seems really late, but to have everything taken out at the same time, you're a candidate, you're coming in, you're getting your paperwork to say that you're declaring as a candidate and you're getting your clean elections packet. Um, everything is done at the same time. It's submitted to us so we can verify everything together. The way this works right now is that a candidate can come in with their um, their their qualifying contributions. Um, we then have to verify them, cut them a check, and then they turn back around. They come back into our office again, and we verify the signatures to become a candidate. So it's it's like two different times they're coming in, and then we're looking at multiple rounds of supplemental. Um, I, I hear everybody when it's saying it's, it, it seems late, but just the flow of, of everything, um, a candidate is potentially going around and getting qualified contributions, and then they're turning around when they can take out paperwork to become a candidate to get signatures. They're going around essentially twice. So I guess it would be helpful for me if we postpone to be able to have not only dates for distribution, but deadlines for submissions to the clerk's office so that you have the opportunity to, like you said, verify and turn everything around. So if the date of initial distribution is July 17th, what's the deadline for submission to the clerk's office? And then with each subsequent distribution date, I think that would be helpful because candidates are going to be juggling so many deadlines for filing and other things that they don't want to be disappointed on July 17th if you say it'll take 10 days to turn around your distribution. That's where I'm going with that. Brandon, just a, a point of clarification, which also came up in this conversation is the, I don't, and, and Councillor Trevorrow can correct me, I don't think the intent was to be so rigid that initial, you could be qualifying during the qualifying period. So you could be turning in your initial qualifying contributions up until a date certain. We can try to back out how early that has to be, but to do date certain to put everybody in at the same time, you may not pull your papers until August if you don't want to. So to, to back into those dates is going to be a little tricky unless we start getting into everybody has to pull papers on the same day, everybody has to turn them in on the same day, which we can certainly do. But the idea in the way the state works is it's sort of rolling. There is no set date for your initial qualification or your supplemental. It's sort of it comes and, and goes. Okay. So, so that means like we wouldn't want to mislead anybody and say your initial distribution is going to be this date because it all depends on when you get your other paperwork in. Okay, that helps. Thank you. Okay, you've all indulged me in lots of questions, Coun Councillor Phillips. I want to go ahead. So because of the way the charter language is written, nomin nomination papers are released for to qualify for the ballot 127 days prior. The first day that you can turn those into the city clerk's office is 85 days prior, which is August 14th. So you can't turn in your nomination petition before then. And that's written in the chart. That's written in the charter. Brandy, can I ask just one quick question too? Maybe this is for Councillor Trevorrow. I'm not sure, but I'm slightly concerned about this uh, in her amendment. The sources of funding number one um, indicates that if once the ordinance is passed, a special appropriation, the sum of five hundred thousand for twenty three twenty four, will be deposited immediately upon adoption of that ordinance. Um, that's going to be prior to the fiscal year starting most likely and I'm definitely concerned about that because I don't have a money tree out front so I'm not sure exactly where where I will get that money from okay I'll defer to Councilor Trevorrow I think I just uh I used her language that they provided but I think it is something to, that we would have to wait for the fiscal okay. year 
That, I think, that, I mean, it's long as, as long as we understand or we can find a, I have to talk with finance director. I just have not, I don't have a specific source right now that, um, that I could draw on to, to, to fund that. And I just want to note that. Yeah. I think the fiscal year starts, uh, July one. So, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. So I think it, wait until the fiscal year. I, I don't know that I had any specific intentions around that and, um, Maybe just that's a point of clarification. I'm fine with not okay. immediately, but thank, thank you, yeah. Counselor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so lots of discussion. I know that we had the contemplation of a postponement, um, Counselor Trevorrow. Do you still want to make that motion to postpone? Yes. Do you want to specify the date? Our next meeting is that a week from today. It's a week from today, May first. Okay, uh, postponed to May 1st. Okay. And we have a second from Councilor Ali. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Still good. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to postpone this ordinance approval till next week. Any discussion on that motion? <laughs> okay. I'm not seeing any. So I think um, all I'll say is that um, we we have this before us tonight. We had this before us in the first read. If if you want to see something different, we got to work with our um, count, our outside council between now and um, I guess Wednesday or Friday is our is our option. So that's I put that out there. We don't have a lot of time to prepare something specific. Um, otherwise, we'll be looking at um, any changes that want to be made would be made to this first read. Have any amendments prepared by Friday morning? Yeah. For the packet wise, I think it would be yeah. nice to have everything put together. It's ideal. I mean, the, the <laughs> tricky thing is you, you can always make amendments from the floor if you're in discussion like you just had with Councillor Trevorrow and that, that date doesn't have to be, you know, I feel like things come from the floor, but we would do our best to do the work in advance. Okay. Okay. Motion to postpone to May 1st, and we'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Okay. Order 171 is postponed to May 1st. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Um, and will the clerk please read Order 172? Order 172, 22, 23, amendment to zoning map regarding R6 residential to B3 downtown business at 211 Cumberland Ave, sponsored by the planning board, Maggie Stanley Chair. Uh, great. And I am going to look to, I'm not sure exactly who's speaking to this, so I'll look to the interim city manager. I believe Kevin's here. Kevin Kraft, are you? And, and maybe yes, Maggie I'll, as well. I'm here. Thank you, um, Mayor. Uh, Kevin Kraft, Deputy Director of Planning and Urban Development. And we have Brandon Mazur, uh, the newly appointed uh, chair of the planning board here, uh, to be able to speak to the board's recommendation on this item. Oh, how funny. I thought about bringing a different tie in. Um, <laughs> so uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Again, it's been a long night, and I will be brief on this matter. Uh, at the February 28th, 2023 public hearing, the planning board unanimously voted to recommend to the city council adoption of the proposed zoning map amendment from R6 to B3 for the area of land that includes 211 Cumberland Avenue and to add the site to the downtown height overlay map, which governs height in the B3 zone. In reviewing the proposal, the board found that the proposed amendments to be consistent with the city's comprehensive plan and noted that the changes would one, bring the existing Franklin Towers building into conformance with zoning for both density and height, which would allow the applicant to rehabilitate existing affordable housing and to facilitate future housing development in the downtown, would foster sustainable growth by providing contextually appropriate housing density in and approximate to neighborhood centers, public transit, and along identified priority corridors, and would provide opportunities for people who work in Portland to have the option to live in Portland. The vote was four in favor, none opposed, with two board members absent and one recused. Happy to answer any questions that may arise on this matter. Uh, thank you very much for that um, introduction. And um, Kevin, did you have more that you wanted to add? And, and Mayor, I do have some slides as is customary, if you'd like me to share those. If not, I, um, all of the information is in the packet uh, that was provided to the council, but happy to share my screen if, if you'd like. Are the slides the same as what's in the packet? 
Uh, yes, just an overall aerial of the site, as well as the proposed zoning map amendment and the existing zoning. Well, if you can put it up, I think that would be great. And that happy would give everybody a visual and then we'll go to public comment. Happy to do that. Um, Okay, so has everybody seen that? Yes. Okay, so here's just an aerial of the site, 211 Cumberland Avenue. You all may be familiar with this. Um, this is uh, the location of Franklin Towers. It's bordered to Frank by Franklin on Franklin Street Arterial as well as Cumberland Avenue. Um, the site is currently zoned R6. Um, this portion of R6 is actually governed by the Bayside Height Overlay Map currently. Um, and heights range from 85 feet to 125 feet on the site. Currently, uh, the existing Franklin Towers is roughly 175 feet tall. Um, so the proposed zoning map amendment would extend the adjacent B3 zone over that 211 Cumberland Avenue parcel. And as Chair Mazur mentioned, uh, sites that are in the B3 zone are governed by the downtown height overlay map. Um, so along with that rezoning would come adding that parcel to the overlay map um, which we've highlighted here in the red box. Um, the maximum permitted height would be 150 um, with uh, street wall heights of 50 feet and 90 feet on the side streets, uh, as you can see in this graphic. Um, and then this is just the final component of the map amendment, which would um, actually remove the parcel from the Bayside height overlay map because it would be being added to the downtown height overlay map. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have on the proposal that's before you. Uh, thank you, Kevin, appreciate that. Okay, so before we go to questions to you, we'll see if there's any public comment on order 172. Um, I don't, <laughs> the council chambers has cleared out, but we do have a couple of hands up on Zoom. So we'll just focus on Zoom and go right to Bill Higgins. Hello, uh, we have a large short of a three really low income, which is under 30% of AMI, every median income and low income housing, which is under 60%. And these are leading to an increasing amount of homelessness in the city. Why can't we just look at increasing all building heights in the city in the back, especially the Bay, Bay neighborhood to either what the, where the intermed building is or the back bay towers is, or the height limits that were approved years ago for the Bayside development that was going to go around where the Bayside Trail is. Increasing the potential number of, these were all increased the potential number of affordable housing units for the city. And I speak of affordable housing units as those that qualify under the fair market rent limits and the area median, median income limits and have the use of, uh, these limits also be updated to when the properties will be completed. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Bill. And next we go to Jay York. Jay, you'll have to unmute from your end. Okay, thank you very much, and excuse my uh, my ignorance on unmuting. That's okay. uh, I think that this zoning change is completely unnecessary for Portland Housing Authority to develop this parcel to increase their housing stock in, on the Portland Peninsula, and I think it sets a really dangerous precedent for pushing the boundaries of what's considered now the downtown zoning into a very residential neighborhood that's been that has been at risk for so many years because of what the city has done to it in clustering services. Uh, I would I would advise all of you to not let this happen. I realized that it was not the planning board's uh, ability to do this because it met all the criteria, but it is yours. And I, again, thank you for your consideration. And I also thank you for the long conversation about, about clean elections, because uh, as Council Fournier said, uh, I thought I knew about it and I realized, no, 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 I knew very little. So thank you very much for your time and efforts. Thank you for your comment, Jay. Any other public comment on order two, uh, 172? Seeing none, I'm gonna close public comment and come back to the council for a motion. 
Second. Councillor Ali with a second from Councillor Rodriguez. Is there council discussion on this issue before you? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote to approve Order 172. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Chavarro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 172 passes unanimously. Will the clerk please read Order 173? Order 173, 22, 23, Amendment to Downtown Height Overlay and Bayside Height Overlay Maps regarding 211 Cumberland Ave, sponsored by the Planning Board, Maggie Stanley Chair. Two different um, orders, kind of related. Uh, so I think we're looking to you, uh, Mr. Mazur. Yeah, and I think as Kevin mentioned, the, the second order is really amending the uh, overlay map. So you've already seen that slide and there's really no new information to, to add. Okay, thank you. That's what I thought, pretty straightforward. Any public comment on this order? Seeing none, we'll close public comment and come back to the council for a motion. Move passage. And uh, Councillor Zaro with second from Councillor Fournier. Any questions or comments from the council? Nope, we will vote. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevaro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Uh, will the clerk please read Order 174? Order 174, 2223, amendment to the zoning map regarding repealing the C5 conditional zone agreement at 22 Park Ave, sponsored by the Planning Board. Uh, thank you, and shall, okay, here we go. <laughs> thank you. I think, I think I like being chair again. Uh, I'm pleased to present the Planning Board's recommendation for removing an existing C5 contract zone and rezoning 22 Park Avenue to a B2B business zone. The recommendation is in response to an application from Community Housing of Maine which has proposed this zoning amendment to utilize an existing seventh dwelling unit to provide affordable housing. In 1991, C5 contract zone exclusively allows the use of the seventh dwelling unit to the YWCA, a former owner. At the February 20th, 2023 public hearing, the planning board voted unanimously to support the proposed amendment, which consisted of one, removing the existing C5 contract zone at 22 Park Avenue, that only permitted the YWCA to utilize the seventh dwelling unit for their team parent services program, and two, to rezone the parcel at 22 Park Ave to the B2B business zone, which permits multifamily dwellings and is consistent with the surrounding context. And we always like to get rid of contract zones where we can, so it was uh, an added benefit. The vote was five in favor, zero opposed, with two members absent that evening. Thank you very much for that. Is there any public comment on Order 174? Seeing none, I'll close public comment and come back to the council for a motion. Second. Councillor Ali with a second from Councillor Zaro. Is there council discussion? Seeing none, we can vote to approve. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Ali? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevaro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Uh, that order passes unanimously, and we'll move next into the orders section of our agenda. Will the clerk please read 187? Order, 180. order 187, 22, 23, approving the renewal of Portland's participation in the Cumberland County Home uh, Consortium, uh, sponsored by the Housing and Economic Development Con Committee, Councillor Pius Ali, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ali. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think uh, Mary Davies might be on Zoom to speak to it. She, oh, is, she is there? Okay. She is here. Yes, Mary. Hi, Mary. Are you here to speak to this order? Yes, I am. Good evening, counselors. Um, the order in front of you is um, an order that will um, allow the city to meet a requirement of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, as you know, we the city of Portland is a um, HUD entitlement jurisdiction, and we receive um, federal home program funds um, as part of the uh, Cumberland County Home Consortium. The city is the lead entity in the consortium. The other members of the consortium are the town of Brunswick and the remainder of Cumberland County. Um, every three years, the city has to, or every three years, all of the members of the consortium have to recertify to HUD that they wish to continue to be part of the consortium. 
And that's what's in front of you tonight is um, the city uh, needs to affirm that they want to continue to participate in the Cumberland County Home Consortium. Happy to answer any additional questions you may have. That's really helpful. Thank you very much for being here. Is there any public comment on Order 187? I see none. I will close public comment. I'm going to come back to the council for a motion, please. Second, Councillor Ali with a second from Councillor Fournier. Council discussion. I'm happy to vote in support of our renewal and to be part of the consortium. So I think we can go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Uh, Order 187 passes unanimously. We'll move on to 188. Order 188-22-23, moving the polling place for District True Precinct 2 from the Portland Expo, Expo to the True Ice Arena for the June 13th, 2023 municipal election sponsored by Ashley Rand City Clerk. And for the record, will you tell us why we're making this change? So the Expo is being used as the temporary shelter. Uh, so on, we do have to move this um, uh, for this election only. Um, and um, this was done in 2019. So it has been moved over to the ice arena before. Um, and it will be upstairs when you enter into the building, that corridor hallway. Um, I've laid it out and sent it to the state so they're aware of the polling location change as well. After this evening, once this gets voted on, we'll send out postcards to the district uh, 2 2 as well, letting them know that this is a temporary change just for this June election. And then November, it'll go back to the expo. That's helpful. Thank you. Any public comment on Order 188? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. I'll look for a, counts, a motion from the council to approve. So moved. Second. Councilor Rodriguez, second from Councilor Fournier. Council discussion on this matter. I see none. We'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. That order passes unanimously. And the last item on our agenda tonight, will the clerk please read Order 189? Order 189, 22, 23, approving the agreement between the Maine Department of Transportation, Portland Area Comprehensive Transportation System, and Portland regarding improvements to Preble Street Extension, sponsored by Daniel West, Interim City Manager. And this is just uh, an agreement which has already been funded, uh, approved through the CIP. It's with PACS. They will pay 49% of this project. We'll be paying 51% or $409,000. And as I said, the funding has already been approved by the council. Great. Thank you very much. Is there any public comment on Order 189? Okay, I don't see any. So we'll close public comment, come back to the council for a motion. So moved. Second, Councilor Rodriguez with a second from Councilor Fournier. Discussion? No, we'll vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. 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 Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. And that passes unanimously as well. And so the last item on our agenda is a motion to adjourn. Second. second. Councilor Ali, second from Councilor Fournier, and we'll vote to adjourn. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali? Yes. Councilor Rosaro? Yes. Councilor Trabarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. This meeting is adjourned. Good night. Thank you, everybody.